Hi guys, uh, we are back on Twitch and this time I have a very special guest with me, uh, National Master uh, Robert Ramirez. How was my pronunciation by the way? Is it like Robert or? Better, th better than mine, better than mine. <laughs> Right, right. So uh, uh, today we're going to do a stream on pawn breaks uh, because, you know, uh, over at my chessboard course, we do have a chapter on pawn breaks and uh, some of the students, they find the topic a bit confusing, a bit challenging. So we thought we could do uh, a stream on it and I'm very happy happy to get uh, Robert with me here. Uh, I've actually been on this YouTube for quite some time uh, to try to learn the King's Indian defense. <laughs> so so when I asked Robert, uh, maybe we could do a stream on pardon breaks because there are a lot of uh, interesting uh, stuff to, to talk about there in the King's Indian defense. But also uh, Robert is uh, a, a beloved chessable author. Uh, he has some uh, new courses out. So I have linked his author page in the chat here. So you should go check them out. I definitely recommend. Um, because you have worked a bit uh, with beginners, have you, Robert? Yeah, actually, mostly with beginners. Uh, before I started to share my content on YouTube and so on, I used to work in Miami with uh, teaching privately and teaching in schools. And it was mostly scholastic students, from taking them from beginners to more advanced. So, yes. That's great. And also hi to all the people in the chat. It's very nice to see you again. Uh, quite a bit of people are signing in, so that's great. Um, maybe we should just uh, uh, jump into it. Um, I don't know, uh, are any of the examples going to be from, from the King's Indian or what uh, do you plan to start with? Yeah, no, we're go I'm going, I'm planning to of course, I have to talk about the King's Indian, not only, well, mainly because that's mostly what I know, right? Uh, for me, I, I always tell my students, I, I haven't, I was not that uh, typical chess player who starts when they're a kid and they do it for a lot of time and, and then they become professional. For me, it was just like two, three years doing chess. I learned as much as I could and uh, I, foc I focused on the areas that I thought were important mm -hmm. and that's it. And it was that information against the world and mm -hmm. that's what I transmit to my students because whatever you see on my YouTube channel on the chessable courses, that's all I know. I, and I always say when I work with someone privately, I try to give them a training plan for them to follow. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to strategy and end game, I always tell them, look, go to my playlist on the YouTube channel because that's all I know. There's nothing more that mm -hmm. I know. So, yeah, so I'm going to start with a little bit of everything. And actually, the first position that I wanted to share has nothing to do with the hypermodern openings. It's not the King's Indian, it's not the Pierce Defense, which is what I always have always played. This is actually, and I hope, by the way, um, can you hear the sound of the pieces? Because it might be annoying if you need me no, to turn no, it off. No, I, I, can, I can't uh, hear those. Uh, and by the way, also chat, let me know if um, the audio is fine uh, on uh, Robert or me. Is it Robert or is it Robert? What do you have? Uh, doesn't, doesn't matter. I get a little, a little bit of everything, <laughs> so don't worry. Okay, okay. But, um, uh, but, but, but first, be, before we dive into it, uh, could we define what is a pawn break? Exactly. That's where I was going. So I wanted yes. to start with this one because it's a very popular opening, the French defense, but it shows us right away what a, what a pawn break is. So a pawn break is when you push one of your pawns to basically attack one of your opponent's pawns, trying to disrupt their pawn structure, right? Like right now, the white pieces, they started by doing what we were learned when we were beginners, which is control the center. Mm. And then the black pieces typically do the same thing. Hey, let me control the center too. That way you don't put two pawns in the center. And if you do, well, I'm going to eliminate it and you have only one, right? So yeah. if this happened, we both have one pawn, one central pawn. But when you do something that is not E5, like E6, then the white pieces should put two pawns in the center and they have mm -hmm. full control over the center. So this is beautiful. But then the black pieces are saying, hold on a minute, I'm going to start a pawn break because now I'm going to disrupt this perfect center that you have. And then the white pieces need to define, do I want to take, do I want to advance, or do I want to live like that? And in essence, if you want to get better at pawn breaks, if you really want to understand this part, all you have to know is how the position changed, changed, uh, changes based on the pawn structure. If they play five, there are plans that we need to keep in mind from this moment on. And a lot of beginners, what happens is 
we just couldn't care less about pawns. We just want to capture pieces. We want <laughs> an opening trap. We want to checkmate the king. Yeah. And, you know, it works because at the beginner level, we are still dropping pieces. I always told my students, if you're under 1200 on chess.com, mm. I can look at any of your games. And before move number 20, you or your opponent drops a piece. But we're not experienced enough to take advantage of that. So you go on ignoring pawns and pawn structures and pawn breaks, <laughs> And you still win because your opponent drops a piece, so nobody cares about it. Until later, you hit a plateau, you cannot move any further, you don't know what it is, uh, why, and it's because you, you're not paying attention to these details. So mm. going back to the pawn break, that's what it is about. We strike, and now they have to react to it. And basically, that's what this lecture or this, this is going to be about. What plans should we adapt depending on, on the pawn structure that we get out of these pawn, pawn breaks? Yeah, so if I understand you correctly, so you would say you define a pawn break when you uh, move it so it makes contact with an opponent's uh, pawn. And then the opponent can choose, will I ignore, will I advance, or will I capture? So uh, so that's correct, I hope? Correct, correct, 100%. 100%. And, 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 and what is what what you would you say is like the main intention of doing a pawn break? Or is it more? Because... I guess one thing could be uh, to open up files mm -hmm. if you if you want to activate uh, your pieces like the rooks for example but maybe if you want to gain more space like like we did here the opponent had a lot of center and now we got uh, some more space for our pieces to ma maneuver behind so but it it could be uh, is there like a main thing or does it depend on the position what is the main main goal with a pawn break no, I mean, typically what you want is to affect the position, right? Like right now, you can see, again, they have more space. We know it's going to be easier for white to maneuver their pieces and attack me because they have more space, right? So what I'm trying to do in this specific position is claim some of that space. Mm -hmm. And then depending on how it goes, for example, let's say they advance. So this is the first thing. What do I do from this moment on? If I ask a beginner, they'll probably tell you, you know what, I'm going to do a check. Or if they're more experienced and they realize, you know what, that's nonsense because they block you, they might, they might say, well, let me develop my piece as castle. However, someone more advanced, they should be thinking, you know what, the pawn structure in the center, this pawn chain is going to tell me my plan from this moment on. And this is why yes. if you talk to a more advanced player, they don't really have to study a lot of opening theory because they understand these principles already. So even if they don't know the, the theory, like we all want to know it step by step, Mm. These ideas help them navigate the opening. For for example, I've never played the French, but I understand my pawn structure is aiming at the queen side. I mm. need to play there. So how do I do it? Typically, you target the pawn in front of your most forward pawn. So if this is my most forward pawn, I want to target this guy. Mm. And you do it by playing c5. And that's why typically in this opening, let's say they go knight f3. Oh, my turn, sorry. You go c5, <laughs> targeting that pawn right away. Mm. Let's say they go c3. Notice how everything occurs on the queen side. So knight yeah. to c6, put pressure on that pawn on d4, then queen goes to b6. Everything happens on the king side. On the queen side, I'm sorry, for the black yeah. pieces. Now, yeah. if I'm the white pieces, I also have to pay attention to the pawn structure. It's aiming at the king side for white. And maybe this is confusing, but if I flip the board, my pawn structure is aiming in that direction. I mm. should be playing there. So what do they do as white? Well, you can see something like f4. Gaining more space on the king side. Let me actually. And they develop their pieces to the king side. Sometimes you see queen g4. And again, all of this is just not because I uh, read a book on this opening or got a chess book course. Mm -hmm. It's just because I understand the principle. I've never studied this opening, but the pawns tell me what I need to do, right? Yeah. So what you're saying is uh, in the direction your pawns are pointing, uh, it will. Uh, uh... Uh, generally indicate what side of the board you should play, right? Exactly, exactly. And important, it, that's when the when the position is locked in the center, right? There's we no... Got, no... Sorry, uh, it's just that uh, we got we got a comment in the chat from uh, Rikto uh, saying it's interesting that these pawn breaks can be important that early in the game. I always thought it comes after finishing development. No, every single time. And look, it goes back to this famous quote, I think it was Philidor that he said, Pawns are the soul of chess. Mm, mm. 
And again, we don't care about that. Okay, fully door, thank you, but I don't. I couldn't hear less because I'm <laughs> I'm a beginner. I need to capture pieces. Yeah. But then, again, when you hit a plateau, maybe around 1500, 1600, 1700, they send you to this again because your opponents are just as good at tactics as you are. So these little things is what's gonna make the difference. Yes. And it's very satisfying. I always <clears> tell my <throat> students, look, you still are not playing chess when you're a beginner you haven't gotten to the beautiful part of chess yet because it become it comes down to this the more strategic the things that your opponents lose and they're like oh i lost the game and i think you were lucky you got you got lucky no no you just didn't know that you were lost since smooth 10 because mm -hmm. of the pawn structure that you got and things like that okay mm -hmm. does that make and, sense am i going yeah, too yeah. fast no no not <laughs> at all not at all this is a perfect pace uh, i'm just uh, agreeing silently but of course uh, you can't see me so you're just hearing that silence. I'm sorry. Um, Adrian says, you might see eight pawns, but some might see eight queens. <laughs> so yeah, uh, definitely. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's the way it is. That's, but you know, I always tell people, even if you're not at that level yet, maybe if you're the kind of player that you've been playing for a few months and you still drop your pieces, this is not that relevant. It's good that you start hearing it. You know what? Mm. It's, it's getting there. Your brain is, re is processing it. And when it's time to pay more attention to it, you've seen it before. So yeah, and even important. even just uh, when you when you draw that arrow from b2 to uh, e5, and just indicate that uh, direction right there, and, and say that this is the side of the board that you should play. This is a very good, you know, visual aid thought rule. That, true, uh, true. That I I still remember the first time I heard it. I was like, oh, why didn't I hear this sooner? You know, <laughs> it, it exactly, makes a lot of sense. Exactly. Exactly. And these are the little things, and I guess it happens in life too, that you go through life and you, then you are 32 years old like I am, and then you hear something that you haven't heard, you're like, ah, oh, come on, I've been 32 years on this planet and now, now I find out. <laughs> and it's little things like that. So, are you 32? Absolutely. Already, yes. Yeah, we yes. were the same age then. <laughs> oh, there you go. There you are go. You, Just you dif different part of the world. Are you 1992 <laughs> model? I'm March 11, 1992. Okay, I'm 1992 as well. Uh, October, so I'm still I'm still a spring chicken. I'm not 32 yet, but uh, very soon. It, it, yeah, it, it, that's the same, that's a joke my wife and I have around because my wife is 92, but she's from November, and for <laughs> eight months I'm the oldest person in, 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 yeah. in, in here. Yeah, right. But right. then, <laughs> okay. But let's, yeah, uh... we're, we're getting old. Bottom line, we're getting old. Let's go back to chess. That's <laughs> that is more important. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, so this is as far as. If the center gets 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 locked, we gotta pay attention to what flank you want to play on. You should pick the one where you have more space, and that's why. Because many people ask me, why why do you want to go? Yeah, the pawn structure is aiming to the king side for white, but why? <laughs> and then yeah. uh, it has to do with the fact that this pawn itself is giving you more space, meaning this knight can never come out to defend. So you should be playing there. You have more space. Expand on that side. You don't want to go to the wrong neighborhood. You want to go to the neighborhood where. You have friends and you have control, so it's, it's the same thing here, okay? Yeah, yeah, it's good that you say this, uh, by the way. Uh, um, I, I I don't think... Uh, yeah, it, it was good that you said it. I, I've never thought to ask about why, but uh, yeah. Yeah, and that's, that's important. Um, I told you before we, we went live, ask me all the questions that you may think of, mm -hmm. even if you, th if you think it's nonsense because it is important that we understand the why. I, yeah. I have never relied on memorizing openings. Actually, my students get surprised when we're doing some training and we play, let's say, the Rui Lopez, and I don't know much about it. And they're like, mm -hmm. how come? You I, I don't know. I just learned my system. I, I understand the plans. I know what I need to do depending on the pawn structure. And that's how I've been able to get to where I got. Not far, but what I got was based on that rather than memorizing openings. So, yeah. but but I also know the why behind every plan and every move. I still lose, of course, but <laughs> I also win sometimes. <laughs> right, right. All right. So, any questions about this so far, or do we well, move on? Uh, we can move on. Uh, I think uh, this is a good example to talk about it because you get this uh, example so uh, early in the opening. Uh, one of the things I struggled a lot with with the King's Indian when I started playing that was that uh, you kind of let White take the center. Correct. And, and then uh, you have to challenge the center later on. So doing that timing and also you have the different pawn breaks to choose from. 
like you can go for e5 or you could go for c5 and it's just like every time i choose c5 it seems like the engine wanted me to play e5 and vice versa and and that <laughs> i couldn't like time it correctly so uh, so that uh, i think was good to to get to practice this uh pawn breaks <laughs> But, exactly. Uh, and, I, and, I, and I'm glad that you mentioned the King's Indian because this example that I wanted to show you now, I think is going to help you a lot with, with that. But based on, on what you just said, I wanted to make something very clear. It is very important that we don't pay too much attention to the engine, hmm. uh, especially if you, pay, if you play hypermodern openings like the King's Indian defense, the, the Pierce defense, engines are programmed to really value space. So whenever the engine says an opening that doesn't claim that space in the center, it's already going to hate it. So mm. keep that in mind. And I got this advice from, um, what's his name? Well, very, very, very good uh, coach. Oh, Gukesh. So Gukesh, his coach, <laughs> I'm listening to an interview of his coach, and he's saying how when he works with these super talented kids, until they're like 2,400 feet there or something like that, they don't really use engines that much. Mm. And he says how it's important that any opening you pick, you really understand it and you like it rather than, than, than playing it because the engine says it's good. So he says, if you pick an opening, let's say the King's Indian, and you study it until the theory is over. Let's say move number 10, theory is over. He says, from now on, try to play this against the engine. And if you can maintain the position for another 10 moves, that's what you should be aiming for. An opening that you understand so well that you can maintain it because you know the plans. Mm. And he says, I prefer that to someone who plays an opening because the engine says this is the best move, but then you let them play for another five moves after the theory is over and they mess it up because they don't, they don't yeah. really know why this is so good, right? Yeah, so yeah. something that I really kept and I think is important. Now, I wanted to show you, this is of course, hypermodern notice how we are letting them control the center and this is an exercise that i do with my students um this is called and before people start criticizing i know it's not popular but this is called the hippo setup right the hippo defense and um i like to do this exercise because from this moment on what i do is i tell them look we're going to get to this position on purpose and then I want you to try breaking the center with e5. And that's going to give you, for example, let's say they play h3. Now I'm going to ask you, go ahead and play e5. And then this is going to give you a very specific pawn structure, right? So if you remember what we said earlier, oh, my pawn structure is aiming at the king side. I need to target the pawn in front of my most forward pawn. So this is my most forward pawn. I got to target this guy. How do I do it? By playing f5 and expanding on that side of the board. And I'll show you later games, full games, where you, where you can see this attack in place. But this position gives you that exposure to it. I'm not saying play this opening forever, just do it once or twice to really get exposure to it. Mm -hmm. Now, from here you could play five or sometimes you get the white pieces play d5. And then again, you gotta decide. There's a pawn break here. What do I want to do? Do I want to take? And then do I like the pawn structure that is going to come from here? Or if they take with the pawn, they open up the file. If they take with the knight, you got this pawn on d6 versus the pawn on e4. Is this something that I like? So these are the little things that unless you really struggle with it, you play it and you mess it up a few times, you're never going to get the hang of it. So this is, I think, um, the kind of exposure that you would need. Sometimes break with c5, sometimes break with e5, sometimes with e5, and then you get exposure to it. Even if you never do this again, you have some experience in this regard. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Not really. <laughs> yeah, I was just uh, what was uh, what is like the main aim of, of, of playing this a couple of times to get exposure to to the what? different pawn structures that you can get based ah. on the on the breaks, right? Like yeah, this opening, okay. what it does is it gives you the perfect field for you to play e5 if, that, if that's what you want to try out, mm -hmm. or d5, or c5. And then yeah. each one of those is going to give you a different, a different pawn structure, right? Because and I I immediately liked c5 a bit better, but I, I think that this, maybe you have probably heard this before from some of your students because we're so worried about the king, right? <laughs> no, 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 it, it's valid. But what I want you to really pay attention to is that if you play c5, this is like playing the Sicilian defense. 
like mm-hmm. Sicilian defense, you start with, and let me actually go back here. Sicilian defense would be like this, right? E4, C5. The most popular opening out there considered to be the best for black is the Sicilian defense. I have never played it because I think it's too complicated. There's a lot of theory. Yeah. You get a no move by move. You mess up the move order, you're destroyed. Yeah. Now, here, you're getting into a Sicilian defense, but delayed. You did your thing, and only later when you were ready, you played C5. Mm-hmm. And then this is going to allow you to get into this pawn structure without memorizing too much theory because you're not playing c5 from move one also your opponents many times get into it and they don't really realize it that they're getting into a sicilian but more importantly for myself for you for anyone if you get this a few times you start to see the the plans associated with this pawn structure associated from the sicilian um you learn from the sicilian and again you're playing sicilian defense and even if you never play it again you're exp- expanding your horizons. You're becoming a better chess player, and in the yeah, long run. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I think uh, I think I might be catching on to. Uh, so, so what you're <laughs> saying, this, this is good because you you get to um, play around with a lot of different pawn structures. Is what you're saying. Perfect. Perfect. Yes. Exactly. Which is which is one of the main critic uh, the main critics that I get. When I first started, I was already 12, 13. And I was too old, according to my coach, because a lot of the kids who, who go to the academy in Cuba, they they would get there when they were five, six, seven, eight. So I didn't have time to play, to learn all of these openings like they did. So I went straight to, you know what? I like this Pierce, Pierce defense, King's Indian defense. Mm-hmm. And the bad thing about, the good thing is you learned your system and that's it. The bad thing is you don't know any more than that. Mm. But the way that I had to cover for that was to get exposure to it through here. You see, I have never played ah. the Sicilian, but whenever I play C5, I know what this is about. So I could play the Sicilian like it happened to me last tournament when I played <laughs> in January. Yeah. I'm playing a line against this grandmaster. He transposes, we get into the Sicilian, something I've never played before. But guess what? Yeah. I was able to navigate it. 50 moves later, the game was a draw. But it's because of this exposure to the different position types and, and so on. Ah, so, that's, you know, that's that's really cool because I, I've heard this uh, as well that, um, you know, it could be good for beginners to experiment with different openings uh, just to get exposure to a variety of different pawn structures. But uh, what I s- see here is like, okay, you only do this system and then you can play around with the breaks and then you will get exposure to many different things. So that's very Correct. cool because then you don't actually have to memorize, you know, 10 different uh, systems or openings or whatever to get that exposure. So that's very cool. That's exactly right. And, so, and again, just to, I'm sorry, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> no, it's just that we got the question from Marikta. Does it make sense to play this position against the engine? Question mark. Yeah, against anyone, against mm-hmm. any, and actually when we do this training, we do, let's say we do a lesson and I told you, look, let's do this, we do it together. And then ideally for the next week, you, you play this just for a week. It's, it's just training and just get exposure to it. Even if the engine destroys you, of course, if you're a beginner, try to play the engine and put it at a level that mm. you think you can play against, right? Don't put yeah. it against the maximum. <laughs> you don't need to right? put it on, on the murder <laughs> setting. <laughs> exactly. So if you typically play, I don't know, um, there's an engine called Martin, which is a beginner. If yeah, you typically play yeah, Martin no. and it's a good competition, play this position against Martin to get exposure to it, right? <laughs> Um, um, so and yeah, Kayuda is asking. So, are there one or two ideas that you will keep, that you will have to keep in your mind that will help you play well in any position? Oh, I, I, I don't think I, I will let Robert answer. But I think if it was one or two ideas that you could keep in your mind that would help you play well in any position, that would be awesome. Uh, but uh, I think it will probably depend on, on the pawn structure that you have, that, that Robert is talking about now. Uh, that is going exactly. to... Uh, oh, by the way, we got a raid here from Jesse February, raided with a party with 265 people. Thank you so mm-hmm. much, Jesse. Um, You're welcome aboard. Uh, I will try to give you a shout out. I am not so good <laughs> with these uh, technical things, and I don't think any of my... Kayudo, maybe it's... you could uh, give uh, Jesse a shout out for me. Who me? No, no, Kayu, the my no, moderator. Okay. <laughs> not, not you, not you. You should only be concerned with teaching. <laughs> no, yeah. I, was, I was waiting for you to finish because I was gonna tell you. If it sounds good to hear that you're also not good with this technical part, because I'm horrible at it as well. So I feel yeah. bad. Yeah, 
<laughs> yeah. So for, for the Raiders, we're having a lesson here today with uh, National Master uh, Robert Ramirez. Uh, check out his uh, chessable courses uh, via the link in chat and also make sure to check out his YouTube channel. He's a great chess teacher that makes a lot of content for beginners and intermediate players. So we're discussing pawn breaks today. Okay, back to the hippo. All right, you got it. So yeah, we just talked about how if you play c5, you get exposure to the Sicilian kind of position. So if, even if you never played the Sicilian, or if you ever play it, you're not going to be like, oh, first time I see it, you're going to be like, you know what? I don't remember when, but I've seen this before. Oh, it was that guy that I, I saw on the live stream <laughs> uh, talking about it. Now, the same thing. Imagine they have played d5, and then you play e5. You're playing a structure that is typical of the King's Indian defense, the Pierce defense. So you get exposure to all of it. You don't have to be specific to one of them. Lastly, mm -hmm. let's say they play five and you decide, I know this is a free pawn, but let's say you play D5, you get this pawn structure, which is typical of the French defense, which is what we talked about earlier. Yeah. So again, it's just about not, this is the purpose is not to make you an expert at those openings. It's just to get, give you exposure to the different position types, the plans. And then regardless of the position you get or the opening you play, you know what the plan is for the next five, 10 moves. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's fun. You know, uh, I'm just uh, so miserable in these uh, French type of positions. I always end up getting mated uh, or get some sort of attack on the king side. I just, I, I get so miserable uh, times I play other openings and I find myself in these types of positions. So, uh, so maybe it's nice to experiment actually, because even though you're playing a different opening than the French, uh, something can happen, and you can you can get out That's of theory, exactly. and and suddenly you are in a French like position, and exactly, and you're getting mated. <laughs> exactly. Oh, no, you know what? Let Let's say you're luckier than we are, because you sound like you're like me. You got mated right away. Yeah. But let's say you don't get mated, but there's nothing worse than being playing a game and you have no plan. You hear yeah. like I'm not checkmated, but I don't know what to do next, mm -hmm. and it's just painful. It's just painful. Yeah. So. Now here, um, if you remember what we just talked about a few minutes ago in the other example, if I asked any of you, what's the plan for the black pieces? What would you we, say? What do you think to, we should? We want to take space go on ahead, the queen go side. <laughs> go, go ahead, exactly. So with it's the, aiming at the, the queen C5 side. And, yeah. I want to target the pawn in front of my most forward pawn. So I want to target this guy and I play C5. And then yeah. all of my pieces should be navigating to the queen side. So maybe I play C5 and then knight to C6 to put pressure on D4. And I tried to expand there. Now, if all of a sudden you, you're told, hey, wait, wait, there was a mistake. You got to play this as white. Well, my pawn structure is aiming at the king side. I Ooh. should be playing on that side of the board. This looks more right? fun. <laughs> exactly. So then it comes down to that. What do you like better? Yeah. This... What, what is that you don't like? Definitely. Uh, but, but this is more or less where we're going with that. Yeah. Now, if I go to this next position, and this was actually an, an actual game played, um, let me go to the same thing. Again, you don't have to play this. I'm not saying play hypermodern openings. It's just a good exercise to get exposure to the different pawn breaks and the pawn mm -hmm. structures. Now, mm -hmm. here you can see when we get to this position, um, after knight f6 hitting the pawn, we got f3. And then again, the black pieces decided to play d5. So this is the pawn break. I'm attacking an enemy pawn and I'm trying to, to disrupt this perfect center that they have in this case. So mm -hmm. they have to make a decision. If they took, now I need to know how to respond. What do I want to take with? And I'm going to ask you, what would you take with? Would you take with the pawn? Would you take with the E knight, the F knight, the bishop, the queen? And well, this is where, where we get complicated when you have I so many options. I would definitely not take with the queen. Uh, okay, okay, that's the, a good way to start process because, of elimination. <laughs> because the knight would just take it, right? Um, Very good. I... I guess I would uh, be a bit hesitant to take with the e-pawn just because I would feel my king got a bit exposed Open. there. Uh, and, uh, and and I like uh, that, the, that the pawns are connected on, on that side like there there is. But maybe I would like to, to take with the f knight. Uh, but, but I don't really have any reason for why I should do it with that one rather than the e7 knight but uh, i guess um i guess it would open up my bishop a bit more and if white retakes with their knight i would have my knight in the center the e7 knight would be in the center 
Very nice. And you actually did something that is very useful. You use the process of elimination. Sometimes, I don't know what the move is, but I know what it, what is not the move, right? Yeah. So this is perfect. But the most important thing for you guys to understand is what's the plan after that? Let's say I take with this pawn. So after my pawn break, the pawn break means nothing. It's just what comes after that. Um, what's the plan? Well, again, if they had played e5, we moved the knight, pawn structure aiming at the queen side, we're supposed to play c5, not mm -hmm. because I read this in an opening course or book, but because I know this, simple mm -hmm. simple stuff. Mm -hmm. Now, if they take, and I take with the knight, I gotta remember what changed. Well, every time a pawn is moved in chess, weaknesses are created, things are changed, and in this case, with no pawn in, on the d file, I have a target all of a sudden. So mm -hmm. I might continue eventually to play queen d7, rook d8 or even cooler your castle queen side and the mm. rook lands over here mm. then this knight your intuition was telling you don't take with this knight maybe i want to put it on f5 mm. and before you know it i have 200 pieces hitting d4 and this is what really really matters in chess not memorizing opening no no opening traps just no paying attention to these little details which has to do with pawns and pawns only yeah and um... I also wanted to mention I didn't want to take with the bishop because then uh, white could trade it for the knight and and we would give the bishop oh. a pair. I forgot to mention. So correct. Uh, and correct. of course, let's say if we get uh, a knight on f6 takes pawn and then and we swap the knight and our pawn mm -hmm. is on e5. If they play c3 to reinforce the pawn, uh, then mm -hmm. we would probably have a new weakness on b2 or. On, on where on B2? Yeah, or... Well, you know what? We don't call this a weakness. And another thing that is important to remember, it took me a long time to really understand this or to get exposure to it, is that a weakness is only a weakness. Even if you have an isolated pawn, it is only a weakness if it can be exploited. Yeah. Okay. If it can be attacked, right? So that pawn on B2, you could say B3 is weak. Like, I can see one of my knights going into B3 and no pawn could ever kick me out. So that's a valid statement. But B2, I think it's a pretty healthy pawn. Actually, this pawn structure is okay. But my job would be to undermine that pawn structure. And it might be in the form of playing C5 at the right time, right? So if, uh, let's say, the B file was open, it would be different? That and would be had, a different and story. We had, and we had a rook because then it would be exploitable. Exactly, exactly, exactly. But then it goes back to pawns again. Let's for a second imagine these guys are not here. If I play rook b8, I know they're going to play b4, mm. right? And they defend the b pawn. B c3 becomes weak, but b4 is taken care of. So if these pawns are gone, I would like to play a5 so that I control b4. You can never play b4. And then mm. I start putting pressure on that pawn. And I just put pressure on it, put pressure on it until either you drop it or you have to bring pieces to defend and your pieces are slaves to defending that pawn. Make sense? Yes, makes sense. Thanks for clearing All right. that up. No, my pleasure. Any questions, bring them on. Now, in the game, after d5, they did not take. They just advanced. And then we bring the knight over to d7. Notice that I think it's pretty natural to bring it to d7. But mm -hmm. honestly, the justification is my pawn structure is aiming at the queen side. The center is locked. I got to play there. And... I need to bring my pieces to the queen side. So this knight came from the king side to the queen side. And then yes. the rook is going to come to c8, and then you play c5 and so on. Now, in the game they played before, you see, it's all about the pawns. Mm. Before, because they understand, I want to target the pawn in front of my most forward pawn. I want to play with his c5. And so they played before. Now, the question to you is, what would you play at this point as the black pieces? And I know this might be uncomfortable for a lot of you. I'm, I don't have a lot of space. I don't know what to do next. Yeah, I would definitely be a bit miserable here, I think, uh, <laughs> because I'm in this French-like position. I feel like my bishop on g7 is kind of biting on granite and I'm not castled. It doesn't really matter because the position is closed, but I just know with myself I would be a bit miserable here. And after b4, that kind of stops the c5 plan. So here I think I would be maybe a little bit stuck uh maybe i would just play c5 anyways just to try to open up the position a bit <laughs> on the queen side <laughs> all right and and that's actually the next point i wanted to start to make through this uh presentation 
the most important thing at the level at the beginner level with point breaks is calculating if it's safe or not. You don't know how many of my students they go C5 and they don't even calculate and then they end up dropping the pawn for free. So th that's the first step in you could pawn like, breaks. You could like prepare it though, if you add a, add a defender, maybe with the rook on C8 or something. Aha, but look at this, you are only using words. You're saying, I might just play it just, just because I have nothing better, you might prepare <laughs> it. <laughs> and we all do this when in reality, you have to really update the image in your head. You have to calculate, visualize that happening. Yeah. So imagine C5 for a moment. If I'm playing this in a, in, a, in a game, C5 comes to mind. Now, let me just calculate that. If I put the pawn on C5, let's say they take with a B pawn. I take with a B pawn. They take with a D pawn. And then can I capture anything at that point? Mm. Is it safe to capture anything or not really? You can't capture that pawn on c5 because it is protected by the bishop, but um, but the pawn on c5 sh should be uh, a bit weak, no? It can't be protected by any other pawns. We could probably pick it up, or can we? What do you mean pick it up? You mean like put more pressure on it and yeah, eventually pick yeah, it up? Yeah, yeah. Well, you might be right, but oh, the problem uh, and, that I have... And uh, wait, isn't uh, e5 hanging? Exactly. But you see, you did not visualize it. No, I clearly. didn't. I didn't. You didn't. And and that's that's the the first barrier that we have to break as a beginner. First, the first problem that I get with that, the pawn breaks is that we just don't calculate enough. We even if we try, we cannot keep track of how many pieces are attacking there. Now, mm -hmm. once we get past that, it's a different story. But we definitely have to visualize. Pawn yeah. takes, pawn takes, pawn takes, and then I pick up on e5. I like this variation all of a sudden. Yeah. And if you think about it, um, after D takes E5 and you take on E5, all of a sudden your position is not as measurable, you're not as um, restricted. They have doubled isolated pawns, like you said, they're going to fall. There's an isolated pawn on A4. So this is looking really good for the black pieces all of a sudden. But if you don't understand these pawn breaks and you cannot visualize two, three moves down the road, you never play C5 because you saw a ghost. And then you're miserable for the remaining of the game. I, kind of I don't know if that makes sense. I kind of wanted uh, to uh, just play e5 and not calculate it because I thought it must be good and I don't care if I lose a pawn there because then at least <laughs> I'll have some more space. But it is not good. I should really calculate like you say. And 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 I even saw a tweet from uh, Susan Polgar here the other day that uh, really made me... <laughs> Go go into myself a bit. I think she just she wrote a tweet something like uh, chess players that don't want to calculate is like a football player that doesn't want to run or something like that. And I was just yeah oh, yeah yeah. yeah she's so uh, right. Look, there's there's another part of it, which is the more you do this, um, your intuition is going to be developed, hmm. and then sometimes like right now you felt like you had to play. Your intuition is telling you, hey. Um, go ahead and do it. So it feels right. But we should get into the habit of backing it yeah. up with solid calculation. Yeah. Because if not, you're playing cards. You're playing cards. Sometimes it might be right, sometimes it might be not. It might not be it. Maybe C5 is good on the next move after you play Rook C8. And then one mm -hmm. silly mistake, you cannot take it back. So, so, so um, uh, this uh, seeing that that uh, pawn was hanging on e5, you need to definitely be able to visualize it. So, do you, you have, have to visualize? A, what's what's like your your best tips to beginners that struggle to visualize? Because you know when you're starting out, you could struggle even visualizing one or two moves. Uh, is there like some mm. exercises that you think are good for visualization for beginners? Exactly. The one that I have tried, that not that I have tried, I've tried many. The one that I have kept in my arsenal to work with my more beginner students, the one that has been more successful is part of any player's training should be to review master games, right? Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter if you're a beginner, if you're a grandmaster, you have to have a, a moment of your training where you say, you know what, let me review some games and just see the ideas and so on. When I do that with my beginner students, and I try to do this, I try to pick up uh, games that are short. I don't want to do this for 50, 100 moves. And then what we do is, let's say I'm going to show you a game that I played in a tournament. Instead of telling you, they played e4, and I played e5, and then knight f3, and then knight c6, what I do is, I tell you the first two moves for you to keep track in your head. We're not moving the pieces. So I'll tell you, the game went e4, 
e5, knight f3, knight c6. So you see, we're not moving the pieces. I just need you to visualize those first two moves. And then it might be difficult at the beginning, but then when you finally visualize it, okay, there's an knight on f3, there's an knight on c6. I can see it. Good. Mm -hmm. Now we move it on the board. Boom, boom, boom. And then we keep going two moves at a time until the end of the game. Mm -hmm. So that in itself, I've seen great results with that. The thing is, not everyone does it um, consistently, and that's the key, consistency. Mm -hmm. And I call it the two-by-two two technique. But then when you get good at that, because the thing is, it's not just going over the game. I'm going to be trying to confuse you, asking you questions. Why did the knight go to F3? What is it attacking? What is, who's defending it? Just to see if you can keep track of the pieces. Then we do it three by three, and then four by four, and five by five. And then we get to the point where maybe you don't visualize five moves clearly, but if you do only halfway really well, mm -hmm. that's really good. If you can mm -hmm. visualize three moves, that's great. And by yeah. the way, this is not something we do with beginners. I have even students who are more intermediate that they struggle with that. They're really good at yeah. tactics, but they struggle with that. Yeah, and it's like, uh, even though, like you said, even though if you don't do it perfectly, uh, uh, that is at least my experience, even though you struggle a bit, still uh, the action of trying, uh, it will still help. And it, exactly. it sh uh, and it should hurt a little bit in your brain when you do this and, and it's normal. And I just feel like when your brain hurts a bit when you're training chess, it's because you're doing something that is working. <laughs> Yeah, no, you're right. You're right. I always that's another thing that I tell my adult students, not so much mm. with kids, because kids typically they do what I tell them to do. <laughs> Adults they end up watching videos and yeah. reading about chess history and 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 so on. And I tell them that's really good. But if you're not doing training that is really painful, that you're calculating there for 15 minutes, you're doing tactics for an hour, mm. then you, it's not active learning. It's not that effective. You mm. could be watching my YouTube videos, for example, for an hour. And then I have your kid doing tactics with me for an hour, just mm. tactics after tactics. You could play after that, after that month, he's going he's gonna to do better. So exactly yeah. like you said, you need that grind yeah, and you need it consistently. Yeah, active learning. That's, that's a good way. Active learning. Exactly. You need, you need to partake in your own learning. You can't just watch, uh, watch us, even though we're happy you're watching us. But uh, No, no, do. look, it, <laughs> this is life. You got to have a balance. Yeah. Everything in excess is not good, but definitely it's really important that you have these kind of sessions as well. Especially if you're a beginner, tactics mm. play games. Tactics play yeah. games. That's yeah. what we should be doing. Okay. All right. So, any any questions before I move on to the next one? No. Uh, I think you're crystal clear. Uh, also, all right, all right. Uh, I, I can see chat is talking, but uh, of course, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to shoot them in the chat as well. Very good. Let's, All let's right. Go so let me then, I have this game that I wanted to show you quickly without too much uh, detail. This mm -hmm. was played by two world champions, Petrosian and Spassky. Spassky was the one who lost to to Bobby Fischer. Uh, great player, of course. And I like to always have this opening or these games because openings are always popular based on what the elite players play. If they play mm. certain openings, they become popular, and then everything else people hate because the elite are not playing it. Mm. Uh, but then this is Spassky playing the hippo, right? Um, and then what I really wanted to show you is how he got into this weird pawn structure um, by playing f6. And this is something that at first when I saw it, it's like, Come on, Spassky, what is this? <laughs> uh, I can imagine your Russian friends making fun of you there. <laughs> Just, yeah. But then all of a sudden, this is actually very typical. You put the pawns next to each other. It's a very well-known uh, approach. And then it's very easier, it's much easier to expand an attack and do the pawn break. So, for example, after Queen E2, he moves the king out of the way. So these are very prophylactic moves. Mm. King, king H1, Queen F7. But pay attention to how after Knight G1, he just goes pawn to e5. And maybe it's not clicking for you yet, but for me that I play so much King's Indian defense and Pierce defense, I see the pattern already. He went from being this weird pawn formation mm -hmm. to taking the shape of the King's Indian defense pawn structure that I typically get. After D takes, F takes, that's it. I got to play on the mm -hmm. king side, and that's what, we, what he was doing. Yeah. All of a sudden, it looks familiar. It looks nice. And his piece concentration is on the king side. So from that moment on, you can see, for example, the bishop eventually comes to pre to play on the king on the king side, and and mm -hmm. so on. I'm not gonna give you the remaining of the game. I have all the games that I want to show you, but just for you to see how you could be in the most bizarre p 
position, if you understand the plans of certain pawn structures, you could try to fabricate that, and then you have a plan. It's much easier to play. Yeah. A any questions about that? No, that, <laughs> that's, that's amazing. That's amazing. Uh, it's just goes to show uh, things can look so weird, and suddenly you can find yourself in familiar territory just based on the pawn structure. Exactly. Chess is pattern recognition, and you have tactical patterns like the forks and the pins that we love, but there's also strategic positional patterns that we have to be familiar with. And now, those uh, are uh, decided by pawns largely. Ex exactly, exactly, exactly. Now, you told me you wanted to talk about, uh, you wanted me to talk about pawn breaks um, through the King's Indian defense. That's what I play. You've been studying it a little bit. So I always show this game, number one, because I think it's a very cool game that I, I played myself. But you can see actually what I've been telling you so far. Not only the what you should do, but you can see it in action, right? So I'm playing my favorite, op not, my, not only my favorite opening, but the only opening I have ever played, which is D6. This system is the pure defense. If they play, for example, C4, it's called the King's Indian defense. So to me, it's been yeah. one system universal against everything. That's all I've ever played. Now, after rookie one, I play one of my plans. So I have only two or three plans that I know. This is one of them. I picked it. And then after they take, notice how they have the perfect center. And then I'm going to challenge that center. I don't, mm -hmm. I don't really want to put the pawn in the center, at least not yet. I want to do it whenever I want to. So they defended. And now goes my pawn break. And again, the pawn break is now about what will my opponent do? I need to know what my plan is if they take. I need to know what my plan is if they advance. Mm. I need to know what the plan is if they leave it like that. Mm. In the game, they play d5. I hope that by now, 47 minutes after we started, you guys know what the plan You're is. You're bringing it to the king side. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And the black, the white pieces should be playing on the queen side. Important, when I play this, if I do anything on the queen side, for the most yep. part, it's only going to get me in trouble. I have no conditions to attack there. My pieces are on the king side already. I don't have space. So that would be only getting me into trouble. Yeah, Same so thing this for white. Is, uh, this is like an important thing just to to mention for the viewers, I think, that are uh, below 1000, is that uh, you can go for a pawn break here already uh, on c6. But uh, that <laughs> is in the opposite direction of uh, if we draw an arrow from c7 to yeah up, that's in, in that's in the wrong direction. So then you're starting to play on white side of the board. So then exactly. you're kind of, then you're kind of just helping white in a way. Uh, that's exactly right. But I guess are there situations where there's uh, uh, exceptions to this uh, rule? <laughs> yeah, it, look, uh, something that I learned quite when I was quite more advanced um, is that there's this um, player, Boris Gulko. He has a series of books that I really like a lot. And he's always saying how every principle in chess is flexible. Hmm. And what I've seen myself, what I, my students really hate because from beginners, we're telling you, hey, follow these principles, like hmm. develop your pieces in the, in the opening, castle the king, right? And then you look at Magnus Carlsen player, any of these elite players, and they don't castle sometimes. <laughs> No. They don't they don't develop the pieces or they develop them and then put them back or mm. put the knights on the edge. And you're like, what is this? And he <laughs> keep, Goku is he does a great job reinforcing that idea that every principle in chess is flexible. And then we gotta first teach you to really get those under control, the principles, and then we gotta help you um undo it sort of way. on exactly and, and and say you know what i know this is a principle but maybe this is not it, it doesn't apply here you know it's very like, i have a i have a little bit of a, a parallel actually because i do art and you know i, I guess you're familiar with uh, picasso mm -hmm, he mm -hmm. was he was trained in classical art and realistic art and he had to learn all the principles and then when he became a master painter he started breaking the principles and he made that abstract the looking art that broke all the principles but exactly. you could you could see there was a foundation there where he he knew what what he was doing so it's kind of a parallel there but uh, uh absolutely and i guess this is it's the same thing for life it's the same mm -hmm. thing for life we cannot be just like okay this is the path and that said you have to be open-minded open-minded and i think that's something we're lacking a lot lately but that's a different that's a different story yeah, yeah. um but <laughs> but to your point let's say after 97 they do, let me just do a bad move here or just anything. 
And all of a sudden I go, you know what? This is a pawn break. I heard something about pawn breaks. Let me do it anyways. <laughs> Why is this so bad? Because not that it's so bad, but one thing that you can appreciate is that automatically they have a D file to put pressure on this pawn. Mm. And honestly, maybe this is not the best example. Maybe we, we're safe to play D5. But this is one of the things. You start pushing pawns and you help them. You create weaknesses like this pawn that is mm. perfectly defended. When you push, weak. All of a sudden they have ways to attack it. And remember what I said earlier, a weakness is only a weakness if, if it can, can be exploited. exploited. And, you're, and you're now letting them do that, right? And this is so that's a, why it's so important. This is in a half open line, so I guess it's, it's weak. Yeah. Correct, correct, correct. So we have to be careful with those things. The same thing for white. They shouldn't, they shouldn't be pushing pawns on the king side. They should put every, uh, all their energy on expanding on the king, on the queen side, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. because the pawn structure is aiming there. So um, definitely 97 was played. I wanted to say quickly, if they had taken, I was planning to just take with the knight. I know this is typical. Yeah. And then it's a fork. I removed the, the bishop. If they hadn't done anything, let's say something like this. Well, they're dropping the pawn. Let's say this. I could just play, for example, take. And then what what changed? The pawn in, on the e-file is gone, which means the e-file becomes semi-open for my rook. Yeah. So th this would be my, my new plan. So it's always about the plan based on the pawn structure. Now, in the game, 97, they go C4. You can see making progress. Remember, they have to target this pawn, and they yeah. want to do it by playing C5. So 97. And, and that is because it, it is the pawn that is uh, in front of their most foremost pawn, like you said. <laughs> Correct, exactly, yeah. exactly. So they need to undermine this guy and then maybe put more pressure on it and get to work through the files that you open up after you play c5 and you take. So that's the plan. Now, I play knight d7. I'm trying to prevent that or at least delay it, but ultimately I need to target the pawn in front of my most forward pawn. This is my most forward pawn. This is my target. I need to play f5. Mm. The knight is in the way, so I move it out the way and then I play f5. And again, to me, this is a plan that I've been playing forever. So it's very natural to me. I really like it. I enjoy it. Even if I lose the game, I enjoy doing it. If I get to play this, I can lose. I'm already happy. But this is um, like, isn't this like kind of the dream for every Kings Indian player, this position right here? At least it is for me. I, I'm very happy when I get to play F5. <laughs> well, you know what? I could tell you Jess and, and look cool here and everything. But I have to tell you here, <laughs> I'm in the wrong side. I'm doing something <laughs> wrong. The thing is... <laughs> I did it because, again, I don't know any, anything else. I know my thing, and that's against the world. Later, I think this game I played it many years ago, but later I, I, rem I learned the hard way that when you play like this, you really need the light square bishop. It is very, very yeah, important. And, yeah. if, and if you remember, I had traded that. Mm -hmm. So here, it's the ideal position, and I really enjoyed it. If I have to play it again, I do the same plan, but always keep that in mind. That light square bishop is very important for yeah. your attack. I have seen some games with uh, Nakamura where he sacrificed mm -hmm. that bishop in the King's Indian. Like the, the light square that... bishop is just hanging out on c8 until it... Uh... Just waiting for that. Yes, just waiting for exactly. the sacrifice. <laughs> exactly. And you see there, what we said before, that's the value of reviewing master games. You have to be part of your training. Because mm. um, there you say, oh, you know what? I saw a game by Nakamura, by, Kar by Kasparov, and they used the bishop like this. It's going to be there. It's just an idea. So in the game, my opponent just went back. They don't like to be on the same file as the queen. Mm. Many people might have this question, what if they took the pawn? What do we do? I always tell my students, hey, have fun. Try them both, and then you, you tell me what you like. But in reality, it's proven that this has to be the way to go. Mm. These mm. two pawns next to each other, controlling all of that, I'm threatening a fork. Not to mention that I got a semi-open file to attack you. I could move the king mm. and attack you. And then lastly, something that I get a lot too is, but aren't you exposing your king? And I always say the same thing. If you think of this bishop as a pawn, you won't feel that bad. Imagine you have a pawn in g7. Yeah. It looks pretty safe, right? Yeah. And, and that's the thing. That's the thing. Just make sure you don't open up the diagonal and things like that. But, but again... This, uh, you have a lot of central control here with the f-pawn and the e-pawn, and, and you can choose to advance either one of them when you want. You don't have to do it right away, I think. And and, uh, and and you don't have to worry about a knight landing on e4, for example. The king should Correct. be quite, the, 
king should be quite safe on h8 and you can put the rook on the g file then and you have a lot of attacking things to exactly do. <laughs> everything you said is is true and it's important this seems basic but sometimes we hear control the center with pawns but we don't know why well it's because you keep their pieces at margin they cannot really operate imagine i do mm. this automatically the knight is going to be very annoying coming into my mm. territory they could put the queen so it's important to keep them like this unless you have a very good reason not to mm. the other thing that you said you sound very confident when you said all of that the rook the king moves over is safe and the rook comes over but a lot of my beginner students they're traumatized by <laughs> all of the different times they got checkmated yeah. for having the king like this right yeah. so it doesn't matter how many times i tell them it's okay it's like they're, tra they're traumatized so it takes some time <laughs> for them to adjust and, and believe me right yeah, but uh, I, I just think maybe you get one cool game in a position like this and then the trauma disappears because you got to traumatize your opponent instead and then you find the fun in it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's the joke with the King's Inn and Defense players. It's like we lose a million games, but when you get that one game and you win in style, then it makes <laughs> it makes up for it. It makes it all <laughs> worth it. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So anyways, in the game, they just went back. I played F4. I keep advancing. Uh -huh. F3. And now... Pay attention again. I'm still, of course, playing on the king side, but if you pay attention to the target pawn, it changed because mm. before this was my most advanced pawn, so I needed to target this guy. Mm. A couple moves later, now this is my most advanced pawn, mm. and this is the guy that I need to target. So I'm going for another pawn break. This is my first pawn break. Mm. My second pawn break is going to be on g4, and you need mm. to prepare it. Again, this lesson is not for you to become an expert at this opening. If you like it, no. you gotta, like you did, go to the YouTube channel, yeah. <laughs> get the chest of a course, or find a book, and learn how to do this, but um, just for you to see how it went on. So G5, notice how the white pieces are being consistent, expanding on the queen side, I'm expanding on the king side. Whoever makes contact first should take the initiative and win the game. So we got bishop D2. All of my pieces now coming behind the pawns to finally attack. That pawn break, which is the main topic of today's lesson, mm. has to come at the right time. I don't want to do the pawn break. And even if it's safe, I need my pieces to be ready to attack. Think of an actual war. Mm. Before everything uh, collapse, uh, collapses, you need everyone in position to, to follow through. Like Think of mm. the Spartans. Right, mm. it's the same thing here. So the and other night like, comes it's over. It's like uh, if if you're going to target, you know, an enemy castle, and you can't just go there with the siege weapons and break down the walls. You need to actually have some infantry or something to to exactly. back it up to go into the walls. So if if the that's exactly are, right. If the pawns are like the walls. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Notice how the white pieces understand that, and they go bishop e two. It's all about this square right now. Once more, I don't think you need to hear this, but. A lot of beginners by now, this is move number 17, they blunder a piece. And then none of this becomes important. So they yeah. win the game thinking, ah, I don't need to worry about pawns. But when you get to a level where people don't drop pieces anymore, you need this. So knight f6, I'm fighting for that g4. They keep advancing. I go rook f7. This is nothing original. It's an idea that I've learned mm -hmm. from reviewing games. You go rook f7 to put it on g7 and then finally play g4. They finally make contact. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Rook lift. They make contact. I go bishop f8. Not only to support that, yeah. I know they're coming down and attack, but finally my rook has that square that yeah. I need. One... Yeah, I think I've seen this idea in some master game. I don't remember which one. I'm pretty sure. Or maybe I I'm saw it on sure. your sh channel, probably. I was going to say, <laughs> please say it was one of my games. But... <laughs> no, no, no. It's just... It's been played for hunt for for lots and lots of years, mm. and again, nothing original. I've seen this before. I know I'm in good hands here. Rook g7. They go knight b5. Then a6. Get out of here. I actually showed this in one of my my YouTube video videos, and every month or so, I get a few comments. People saying, "Why did they go back? Why didn't they go to c7? They don't realize the rook is here." <laughs> so, yeah, right. I, I yeah, hope. because you're not used to having that uh, rook on the seventh rank. <laughs> Correct. But for us, if we play this often, we know the rook is there. So there's no room for blundering if they play knight c7. So anyways, I kick them out. You see, I am i haven't moved anything on the queen side, but here it comes with the temple. The knight has to go back. And then time for me to 
start getting closer. Knight to h4, all of my pieces playing on the king side. They move the king over, they know what's coming. I still don't feel ready for it, so I need to bring the queen in. I could do queen d7 mm -hmm. or queen e8 to get to g6 and have a powerful battery. So a5, queen g6, rook g1 defending. Whenever I'm playing a game and my opponents do a defensive move, oof, it feels so good. Because now <laughs> they're, they're not attacking me, right? They're, they're getting yeah. ready for me to attack. Yeah, yeah. Now, finally, I play g4. They go bishop e1, attacking the knight. And by now, you should not miss this opportunity to open up the position. I just didn't want to lose the knight, so I closed this in. This is typically disaster because that's it. Your pieces won't be able to penetrate. Uh... There's no way in it. And then this is when, what we talked about before, if you had the light square bishop, yes. you would sacrifice it and you win the game. Yes. So that's why it's so, so important. Yeah. The bishop doesn't do anything other than sit there. Oh, it's time? Okay, go, sacrifice. I did it, not because I didn't know that, I've been playing this for long enough. I did it because I knew, you know what? I don't have the bishop, but I could bring the knight over to do that. You can so, sacrifice the knight instead. Correct. So if I want the knight to go to h3, what, how do I go about it? Well, I need to be on g5. If I want to be on g5, I need to be on h7. Yeah. If I need to be, well, that's it. <laughs> that's your route to get to, that's like, uh, to h3. That's like root, uh, root uh, planning. Exactly. That's so, exactly so, right. so the key here is right. Uh, the, the key here is that um, you don't have any more pawn breaks left because you advanced to g3. So if you want to open it, uh, the wall, castle walls now, you kind of need to fling. Uh, a piece into it to crack exactly up the exactly and it's important i know probably you already got this but it's important this pawn breaks the main objective you asked this at the very beginning i was like come on wait until i get to my game no, just <laughs> <laughs> so you, you were asking what's the point the point typically is to alter the position in this case i need to open up lines for me to attack and, and checkmate that king so typically if you get this opportunity you open up lines you take on h3 you take on f3 but again here I saw the other plan. They attacked my rook. I didn't I didn't leave it there, of course. Rook c8, I'm thinking, I'm gonna take you to just delay you a little bit more and this knight is not gonna do anything. Hmm. Something I wanna, it has nothing to do with this, but I wanna use this opportunity to point it out. I really like this pattern of two squares away from the knight. My bishop two squares away from the knight controls the knight completely. Anytime, particularly oh. if you're in time pressure, I'm always looking for that pattern. I have a bishop, boom, two squares away from the knight, that knight is controlled. I don't oh, have to think. That's very nice. I never I never heard that or seen that before, but it makes great sense because the bishop is uh, controlling both of stars. Exactly. Now. Exactly. There are a lot of things, a little there are other things that really help, especially if you're a beginner. I know you fall for knight forks a lot. <laughs> so I actually have a video on my YouTube channel about the little things to keep in mind, right? One of them is like that. Bishop controls the knight. Uh, but anyways. I but go is 95. That, uh, is that in both uh, directions, by the way, or only? Any, any, uh, anytime, anytime. If, any, like, imagine this knight of mine, right? Mm. If this king is a bishop, you can see how the bishop controls the knight. Yeah. I cannot yeah. get any closer. Yeah. Anytime you have a bishop versus knight, two squares in between, of course, on a line, on a file or a mm. rank, mm. you control it. Imagine this knight is right here. I cannot get any closer because this bishop is controlling all of that right so, so two squares away from the night horizontally or vertically doesn't matter that is a very good thought rule and our visual aid i haven't seen it before it was very nice yeah yeah and again particularly if you're in time pressure you have a few seconds left mm -hmm. you don't have to mm -hmm. be like oh is that not gonna jump lastly imagine this knight is only four this bishop only one being two squares away controls that knight i don't have to worry oh do you have a fork no no the bishop controls mm -hmm. keeps you at margin Again, nothing to do with that. Let me let me get to the good part. Yeah, yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, just kidding, just kidding. Uh, so yeah, finally here, I, they knew what I was going for, but there's nothing they could do. Finally, we got knight takes h3, pawn takes, then oh, pawn to g2. Juicy. If you take checkmate, and then what do you think is the next move? Don't tell me it's a pawn break. It's not time for. No, it's <laughs> oh wait, I just uh, oh these are like the when you know you have the knockout blow, you just don't want to mess it up, right? Take your time, take your time. I didn't want to put you in the spot, but I'm gonna make no, you no, suffer a little bit here. No, no, it's it's fine, it's fine. Uh, I should do I should do this. 
This is usually where I mess up in my games, by the way. I get these really nice attacks, and then when it's time to hit the uh, football in in the goal, uh, I just uh, crumble. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that that's why yeah, it's so important. Everything we're talking about here today, it's pointless if your tactics are weak. If your tactics are not where they need to be, it doesn't matter. You could have the perfect plan, the perfect strategy. You miss a fork and you drop a piece, mm -hmm. that's it. nothing matters. So, so here, tactics, uh, tactics, tactics. Yeah, mm -hmm. let's see. Chat is very eager to sacrifice that queen. And it looks like, <laughs> it looks like that will be checkmate. Yeah, that, that, that's what beginners like to do. Just do the check. Come on. Mm -hmm. What if the bishop takes, you guys? Pawn takes. And then the king takes the pawn. Uh, isn't that protected by the rook? No, I mean this pawn. I take this pawn. Isn't that protected by the knight? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Just trying to be funny. Uh, I was just like, huh? <laughs> <laughs> <And my blood. laughs> I didn't understand anything. <laughs> no, that's it, that's it. So uh, that's a beautiful checkmate. And again, this is one of those games that you could lose a million games playing the, these openings. Mm -hmm. But when you push all of the pawns in front of the king, you leave it naked and you finally get a beautiful checkmate. You're like, you know what? I can't lose the next 20 games. This has made it. I, I met my quota for, for the year with this kind of attacks uh, and you, you know this this was glorious and and the, you know i've never seen a checkmate like this one with the two pawns it was kind of funny <laughs> no yeah 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 absolutely do, do absolutely. you get this often <laughs> no not this kind of checkmate but i do get this kind of attack often mm, mm. and and it's what keeps us coming back like anyone i dare to say anyone who plays the king's indian defense is because they saw a game like this and they're like i, I want that yeah. And then they get into it, right? The one for me um, was uh, the cheesy one, you know, with uh, Nakamura against Gelfan. Yeah, that's that's a beautiful one. That's a beautiful one. <laughs> it's the one that's everyone saw, I feel like, but it is a pretty cool game. Yeah, no, and then you spend five years of your career trying to get it the same way, and no one plays it. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but no, but it's really good. And uh, again, these concepts, please don't think, oh, you only get this if you play the Kingston in defense. Any position where you have the mm. locked center and you you follow what the pawn structure is telling you you're mm. going to get a similar attack but again it doesn't come after learn, listening to this lecture you need this lecture lots of games lost trying to make it work and then you finally get the get the hand yeah and you probably will not get it if you play uh, this queen side openings with locked center like french because then you're going to play on the queen side and there's usually no king there unless they castle exactly yeah, yeah yeah no i mean i mean there's something good there too don't get me wrong but it's a different kind of plan if you're successful mm. on the queen side you're gonna probably gain material penetrate eventually get me in trouble but if i'm successful on the king side i'm going for your king like you said and it's gonna be checkmate so right? i'm so very mad says feel like i'm the only fool that plays king's indian defense and i'm scared of pushing my pawns <laughs> as long as you understand the why and again we're doing it because the center is locked the moment they mm -hmm. if the center is like this where it could be easily opened up yeah i don't want to push the f pawn because then they could hit me through the diagonals and so on mm -hmm. but when this happens i could just push the pawn like i did because you don't have diagonals to attack me with or through you don't have lines to get to my king only when the center is locked don't mm -hmm. do it anytime right Mm. So that that's the whole point. And again, if you understand the plans, you know you should be you should be okay. Yeah, I think this uh, was a very good example because it shows you went for the uh, pawn break yeah, on f5, and then you went past. So then you need to go for the next pawn, and then mm -hmm. Ex exactly, exactly. And then exactly. once uh, that uh, last pawn break uh, disappeared, you showed how you can still open uh, with the sacrifice. Exactly, 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 exactly. And it all has to do with that. We were not able to get to that king until we made that pawn move. Pawns, mm. pawns, pawns. Yep. All right. So how are we doing with time? Do we have time for a few examples or? Yeah. Yeah. Let if me, you me... if you're up to it, we could definitely do a bit more. Just yeah. Uh... Let me know because I could be here for I could be here for twenty hours. So I I, I, will, I will definitely let you know. I think people are enjoying. Glad to hear. And okay, so let me go to this older one which again through the openings that i play you know the king's indian defense and i wanted to show it to you because it's a different kind of pawn break you see here pawn break i'm attacking one of my enemy pawns by trying to disrupt their structure and what i'm looking for here is 
typically, as a King's Indian defense player, I know when they do f3, bishop e3, queen d2, that's, this is they're the prioritizing. Same right? That's the same as variation in the King's Indian defense. But regardless of the name, the one thing to remember is they are prioritizing queenside development. Notice yeah. how these guys have not even moved. Yeah. So I know from experience, but you should also smell the fact that they might be trying to castle queenside yeah. and then attack you heavily on the king side. So yeah. this pawn break is a way for me to try to open up lines to attack the king when it goes to the other side. So it's just another way to use your pawn breaks. Mm -hmm. In uh, the games, typically we get something like this. You develop the knight. Notice how I'm not castling because I know what they're coming after. So the king stays in the center. Another principle that is flexible. I should castle, but I'm being flexible about that. I, I think this and is then, very funny if I can just uh, shoot in here because I, I learned this plan from you, by the way, at, uh, at YouTube. Uh, because I got <laughs> mated so many times in this same variation. And I, I had a game pretty recently where I did this plan. And it was funny, it was online, but I could kind of notice my opponent got very uh, thrown off because they exactly. didn't know what to do because I didn't castle kingside. So they were like, but but what should I do then? Because they started launching their pawns, but it wasn't really scary because my king was not on the king side. So exactly, exactly, and and that's that's something that that we see a lot. A lot of people when it's time to study, if you're the white pieces, we all know how to play against the Sicilian defense and the Nimso Indian and this and that. When it comes to the peers defense. All their openings, people don't really care that much. They're like, yeah, when, when I get to play them, I'm going to do this plan, very simple, and then attack them. In my experience, the moment I take that away from them by not castling, they have no plan. And some of them, they still do it, even though my king is not there. And it becomes very, very easy. For, for example, here, all I need to do is take on c4, thanks to my pawn break, I'm opening up the file and attack them. They might attack me on this side. Let's say they go... I'm even going to take because again, I couldn't care less. My king is not here. <laughs> I I take and you see this is uh of course nonsense, but thanks to my open lines, I'm already um picking up the fruits because yes. of the the pin. Right. All right. So that was so just a I, quick I one. Just, I just want to go mention ahead, go ahead. I just want to mention as well for for the beginner level viewers that uh, of course uh, when the opponent castles queenside, um uh, and and you and you castle kingside. You usually get these positions when you start going for a, a pawn storm. So so that is what White is dreaming of in in this kind of position because then they can just play on on the h4 h5 plan and start storming you on the king side. So the thing is, when you notice that they're going to castle queenside, and you usually castle kingside, maybe just by delaying castling a bit, uh, you you can throw them off a bit with their usual plan. Exactly. That's a, that's a good point. And actually, that's this is the plan that almost made me stop playing this opening. I was getting killed every single time. I almost gave up on it until I finally said, "Wait, wait a minute. What what is the problem?" Well, <laughs> let me let me stop casting. But just like you said, I actually went I went very fast there. This is what they're looking for. Let's say I keep doing my thing. They want to make contact. Forget about taking because you open up your king. But even if you don't, let's say I keep bringing my pieces. They play bishop a6 to remove this great defender that we have. And let's say we take. Now, they take, they take. And of course, you could take with here, which is not that good. But just to show you my point, you can see the easy plan. Thanks to the final break, hmm. they just have this checkmate. And again, it has to do with the pawn break. This is a pawn break right here, just to open up the file. That's it. This is what they're looking for, this beautiful yeah. checkmate. I fell for it many, many times until I finally said, no more. Let me just <laughs> leave the king on, in the center and come get, come get me here if you want, right? Yeah, and this so, is also the importance of uh, analyzing your games as a beginner, because then you will catch it if you lose in the same way a lot of times. And then if you, if you lose exactly. in the same way a lot of times, then it's time to start uh, trying something new. <laughs> 100%, yes, 100%. All right, let me see what else I had here. Uh, I think... By the way, uh, chat is uh, complimenting you, saying you're a great teacher. Uh, thank you, thank and you. that they're having a lot of fun. Well, glad to hear. That's until they get really advanced and they're like, you know what, that guy was not that good. <laughs> now that I'm more advanced. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, thank you, thank you. Um, I really wanted to... 
Okay, so I wanted to show you this other game again quickly. This was not one of my games, but it's a game that I like a lot. Um, same thing you mentioned, they go queenside. Mm. And uh, the black pieces quickly realize, well, I need to make contact. I need to attack you. So F3, bishop B7, H4, trying to make contact as well. Mm. H6. And this is very important because now if they play um, H5, what do you think we should do? How do you react to that? G5, exactly. Go if you start to get the you, hang of it... You lock down the, um, the bishop queen. The five. Uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, exactly, exactly. So very careful not to open up. It's going to be very easy for them to make contact. Um, to be honest, many times when I play this, I see H4, I just play H5. And that's mm -hmm. a good way to just keep them at margin. In the game, they just played it like this. Then rook c8. Notice how the rook is on the same file as the king. But more importantly you can see already what pawn break we're going to have. C5 is cooking. Yes. So after G5, they took. Again, I typically just play H5, keep everything locked. But uh, the black pieces in this case decided to take. And after bishop takes, pawn to C5, knight takes, bishop H3 hitting the rook. We have a very nice move, which is pawn to B4. Just and ignoring. basically, they're, exactly. They're saying, if you take my rook, I'm going to take your knight, hitting the queen, so you don't have time to do anything here. Mm -hmm. When the queen leaves, I get your bishop as well. And this is very important. Um, I've seen this a lot with beginners. Yeah, yeah. It takes a while to understand that two minor pieces are better than a rook. Mm -hmm. So that's what we're saying here. Give me the knight and the bishop for the rook. It's just better for us. Mm -hmm. But not only that, if I get to take here, if you take me back, mm -hmm. your king is exposed. This b pawn is going to be gone from the b file. I should be able to attack your king, especially since I have this powerful bishop over here. Mm -hmm. So in the game, they played knight d5. They don't want to take. And then I'm going to ask you and the viewers, how would you continue from here? What would you play? Sorry, you just uh, lagged a little bit here. But uh, yeah, you asked uh, what we would so, play here. Um... Yeah, no, my, my question is, yeah, how should we continue? Again, keep in mind, it's this aggressive approach where they castle to the queen side hoping we castle to the king side and in this case that we didn't they're coming for us anyways in the center they're going for the king but it's our turn how do we continue mm, okay uh, immediately i want to sacrifice my bishop on b2 but i'm going to calculate this time like you said i will do it the right way <laughs> there you go by the way, uh, no one has said it's the right way. Don't, <laughs> just in case. No, 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 no. <laughs> we should. We should calculate. Uh, I, I just immediately, I think it looks good because you can follow up with knight's uh, knight, uh, check. You could get the queen in. Uh, and I just feel like this has to be good. But uh, I'm being a bit lazy now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You sound you sound like me. That's how I know it cannot be good. You sound <laughs> just like me. Oh, okay. So you're a bit like say as I do not to <laughs> say as I do not. To... No, I, what is nah. the saying? I don't remember. What what is the saying? I, don't know. I think it's something like uh, do as do, I do say. Do as I say, not as not I do. Not as I do. Okay. Exactly. Uh, okay. No, 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 no. Takes... I've learned I've learned my lesson the hard way, and I I really try to calculate. And this is important. Um, I've lost too many games like that. Yeah. If, for the most part, if I don't see something concrete, I would rather make a move that maintains the position and, and keep on going. Unless mm -hmm. I have a really, my intuition is really telling me go for it. Um, I, I, I've learned my lesson. Uh, also, I feel, uh, you know, this, the pawn on the C2 could quickly be in the pin. So I was just looking at B3. Okay, very good. I'm not going to torture you that much. If we were training you and me only, I'll be making you calculate everything. Mm. I, I think but the candidate moves are a bishop taken, but also B3. I like B3 a lot. Exactly. And then you calculate and you compare. Okay, if I do this, they take knight a4, knight c3. Ah, it's not so clear. My queen is not ready to back mm. them up mm. yet. But then if you look at B3, mm. and this is actually what they played, it's a pawn break, mm. trying to disrupt their pawn chain, which is defending the king. This is said, I'm threatening to take and then promote. Mm -hmm. I'm threatening to lift the knight and then take on c2. And ultimately, it's just a way for me to take the initiative. Whoever makes contact first should win the game. And if they so, take the pawn, you get the royal fork. Oh, yeah. That would be, be a dream. 
that would be a dream. Boom. There's a pen. The pawn cannot take me. And thank you. I'm going to get the queen. That's exactly right. In the game, they played king b1. But then we have knight takes e4 Ooh. because we're ready to take on c2. So knight e4 with a tempo on the queen. And again, n none of this makes sense to really study it if our tactics are weak. Strategy eventually leads to tactics because strategy is helping you place the pieces where they belong, yes. get a good attack. But then if you don't see these tactics, it makes no it makes no sense. So knight e4, b takes e2, fork, give me the rook. And then from this moment on, it should be an easy win. We're winning by three points. But honestly, I'm very capable of messing this up, <laughs> <laughs> even though I'm winning. So it's important that we really train this. In the game, they play rook c4, getting away from the from mm. the attack, putting pressure on their weak pawn. And this is really important. When you're doing your tactics or you're reviewing games, you get to position like the, positions like this. It's a great exercise to say, you know what? From this position, I'm so capable of messing it up. Yeah. I'm going to set it up against the engine and play it yeah. against the engine. Yeah, I, this and is I gotta really be good. able to convert. Yeah, this is a really good tip. I actually played... Uh... I played a rapid game today where I was plus six and then I just managed to mess it up in the end. And it always sucks, you know, because you, you are really you feel like you deserved it, but but you don't because you weren't able to you weren't able to convert it, so you didn't deserve it. So to, to put up those the position that you felt like you deserved and actually play that out against the <laughs> engine, then you can prove it to yourself at least and you also get to practice. Because there's exactly. a lot of uh, there's a lot of opponents that just resign when they're like minus uh, three or minus five or minus six and and they resign so you don't get to practice the positions but when push comes to show you actually need to be able to convert it to a win. you have to the only way that i got good at that and I, I i mess it up less and less every day the only way i got good at was by doing that set it up against the engine yeah. and then you really start to unconsciously you know what you need to look for when you're winning like this mm -hmm. and if you don't do it you're gonna be in the, like i have a student a student of mine he He's always very upset because he's playing people online and he shows me the game. He's winning by a lot. Like he's destroying them. He knows he knows probably more chess than I do, but he's very slow on the clock. So he's winning by yeah. a queen, but he has five seconds. And then he's like, I can't believe these guys don't resign even though they're, <laughs> they're down a queen. <laughs> and I tell him, look, uh, until you win with five seconds on the clock you don't deserve these wins so it's not them it's, it's you and then yeah we've been training that until he finally he's gotten that under control but i know it's frustrating and we have to train it we have to train it so it this part is not that important we're winning by a lot but just to show you uh they're now just something that i always do simplify the game i'm ahead mm. eliminate those pieces that could get you in trouble simplification mm. um, queen b6 put pressure this checkmate is coming in mm. they defended it um, rook before, just drill on it. There's a weakness, You and this is what I told you at the beginning. A weakness is only a weakness if, if you, you can, can exploit, exploit it. it. And that's why this is just so bad for white. Knight f6, the only piece that is done that is not doing anything, because even the rook is doing something. Then give me the pawn, everything is collapsing, knight is coming to the attack, and, and sorry if I'm going too fast, no, you're but not. this is just to show you how the game finished. Look, again, I'm not trying to checkmate the king, just simplify the game. This is the one piece that could mess that up for me. I've gotten checkmated like that many times. Yeah. So they're saying, let's get rid of it. And after queen c5, the white piece is simply resigned. But uh, very, very important to take our time, not mess it up. It really hurts when we're winning and we and we blow it. Yeah, and like yeah, just simplify, like you say, because when you are ahead by an officer, uh, if you if you get to trade all the officers on the board, you're left with one and they're left with zero. So it's just like the more you can remove, the, the better for you. And similarly, the, the, the opponent should try avoid trading uh, officers. Exactly. But, yeah. If I'm white, I want to keep the pieces because I'm lost if I just trade. I need to complicate the game. 100%. Yeah. Or, all right. Okay. So, I'm sorry. Any questions? No. Uh, they're just uh, saying it's funny to hear a, a national master saying they may mess up a plus three advantage. <laughs> Look, not 100%, 100%. But not only me. I always tell my students whenever you're having a bad day, go in online and look at games by the elite players. How many times have Chaos and Blonder actually checkmate in three moves? You see all of these elite players blundering pieces left and right. Yeah. Of course, it's rare, 
but it happens. And these are people that all they do is chess and they've been doing this for their entire life. So what's left for the rest of us, right? Um, I recently, when I launched the latest chessable course, I, something that I like to do is I do a speed run. So chess.com gives me an account from 600 or 500 and I bring it up to 22 or so. And uh, you can see me there struggling. I get to 2200 and plus, <laughs> but I struggle with it. Eventually I get there, but it's not like, oh yeah, every single person be- below my rating, I, I get them on easily. It's, it's not the case. Right, so, right. And it, and it happens. Like I think my main account on chess.com is 242500. But if I have a bad week or a bad month and I just go down to, let's say, 22, 23, mm. I struggle to get back. I will get there because I think mm. my strength is around that. So eventually the rating follows. But I lose a lot of games before I get there finally. But I think this is also an important thing to mention because uh, on the course forum of, of my course, uh, uh, we have a thread where we just talk about chess and show our chess progress and things like that. And I've noticed nice, nice. a couple of students are worried because the rating is fluctuating. Like, is it normal? Like, I broke 1000, but now I'm back again to 900. Now I'm down to one uh, 850. Then I climbed a bit, mm-hmm. but I go down. And it's like I have to break 1000 a couple of times before you actually break it, right? Because it's normal to have these fluctuations. It is, it is. I always I always tell my students, your rating should be like this, up, down, up, down, and then you finally break, let's say, 700. And since you've moved up, your the, the pool of people you're playing against is going to be higher. Now you're not playing 500 rated players, you're playing 800 rated players. And mm-hmm. they will remind you, hey, you don't belong here, so you go back down. Yeah. And then until you finally adjust and you prove that you belong there, then you adjust. And then you do the same thing over and over. Yeah. But the worst thing you could do is pay attention to the rating. Yeah. I always tell people, it took me, again, I started when I was like 12, 13. It took me three years to get the strength that I got. But mm. I think it was so it was so easy for me, easy, because I was, not, I was not playing rated tournaments. I was just having fun. I would go to a local chess academy that were not rated tournaments. I would just go there and play because I liked it mm. and study because I liked it. So it was three years just having fun. I never looked at my rating. When I finally came to the U.S. and I played rated tournaments, Boom, I got to 2300 mm-hmm. because of the strength that I got. But I got the strength by just playing, just having fun. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a bit uh, it's a bit of a bummer, actually, that uh, there's so much focus on rating because it shouldn't really be, be a focus. And uh, I think that's one of the most important things you, you should learn to cope with as a beginner is to not pay so much attention to it because you're only going to get it's frustrated. Human nature. <laughs> it's, and, it's human nature. We, we want to measure it. We want to compete. <laughs> yeah, but but even uh, Magnus Carlsen said recently in an interview that uh, his classical rating sucked. That was like, quote, that was what he said. And it's like, if Magnus Carlsen thinks his classical rating sucks, I don't think anyone is happy with their rating then. So you yeah, shouldn't yeah, exactly. care. <laughs> no, no, you should not care. And actually, there's, I think there's an, uh, an, an anecdote of, uh, I think if the student goes to the teacher and tells him, hey, um, if I focus more than my my, than my fellow students uh, how long would it take me and the teacher is to, to get that to the goal and the teacher is like oh like 10 years or something like that and then he goes uh something like okay if i if i work twice as much or something like that and the end of the story the teacher is like no it's going to take you uh twice as much and then he goes like how much if i uh, how come if i'm going to be working twice and the bottom line is the guy the teacher is like well it's going to take you longer because you have one eye training and one eye on the goal. And mm. you should have both eyes just training focused. And, and, and that's, uh, that well, was that, my experience. That's a really good uh, way of putting it, actually. That's a very yeah, good way I, of putting I, it. I, I ruined the story, but you get the point. No, <laughs> no, no. I, I, got, I got the point. Uh, <laughs> let's see. Uh, we got uh, some comments. Uh, I got the 670 rating and then below 500 in a few weeks. Well, I just broke uh, one. I just broke 1600 and straight after breaking 1600, I went down to 1500, uh, almost down to 1490. I haven't been solo in a long time and I was just riding, uh, mm-hmm. riding a high and I just won every single game. And then uh, when I broke that uh, threshold, I just bumped uh, down by a lot. And it's just like, I don't really care about it, to be honest. It's a... Uh, uh, then I get to play some weaker players now and have a bit more fun. And then I, when I get up again, it will get harder. But 
It's the way it is. If you're yeah. training consistently, you don't have to worry about anything else. And again, mm. it's it's like anything in life. You put the time, the consistency, and forget about that. Mm. Um, it, 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 it's the same thing with. It. I, I was talking to a student of mine about investing the other day, and 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 we're talking about that. If you don't worry so much about, uh, like the stock market, we're talking about that. If you don't worry too much about if the market is up or down, if you just mm. do it consistently over and over, those up and downs are eventually gonna um happen no matter what and you, it's gonna work out for you anyways so just forget about that just train 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 if you go down fine you go up fine just keep training if you see that you've been too long in a rating range then talk to someone okay hey mm. can you look at my games what, what am i missing mm. you said 1600 in my experience a lot of the students that i work with what it what they're lacking to get to 17 to 1800 is end game They've gotten yeah. to 1,600 <laughs> because they're so good at tactics. That's what they've been doing for the last, since they started. Yeah. And those tactics plus knowing their openings got them to that level, but then they cannot get to 1,800. And that's because their end game is not there. So yeah. now it's time for them to try an end game. So something I to lose, think about. I lose a lot of games in the end games, unless I find a cool end game tactic. So I, I guess that's, um, that's pretty correct. But also I have a nasty habit of resigning too soon because I believe too much in my opponent. So I'm like one of those, okay, I drop an officer and I'm just like, okay, you will be able to win this. So I'll just resign. But the, the truth is, uh, I could still uh, get lucky. So uh, no, no, uh, it, it definitely, definitely is a, it's a combination of a few factors. It could be that maybe you resign too early, but definitely uh, maybe the end game. And, and I'm not talking about read an entire end game book. I always say it. I've never read an entire endgame book. I just know my pawn endgames, my rook endgames, mm. and that's it. I just know the main ideas, the principles that I need to follow, mm. and that's it. Mm. All right. Okay. Let's uh, so get some more me, Yeah. Let me just, I, I have just a couple more that I wanted to go over here. Yeah. And. Mm. Let's see, I'm so very mad. I stopped playing rapid because I got to 1650. Can't go back down if I never play. Yeah, but then you won't have any fun then. <laughs> then you will, no. will not be playing any chess. Maybe you need to start a new account then. <laughs> no, look, something that uh, I have this uh, this um, person, she followed me, she followed my YouTube channel. She tells me, oh, I started playing chess because of a YouTube channel. She's from India. Mm -hmm. She tells me the story one day. She, I don't know what happened. She was not doing great in life and she looked at the YouTube channel. She started playing chess just to get her head off that situation. And she actually got really high, like 1900 or something like that on Lee Chess. But one thing she did is there's an option. I don't know exactly where it is, but there's an option that you can hide yeah. the ratings for you Send and your mode. opponent. Okay. Well, I don't know what it is, but she did that. And she played for a long time without looking at it. And then, boom, all of a sudden she looks. I'm, I'm playing at the 1900s. I've beaten people who are really, really high rated. And, if, and she said, if I had known they were that rating, mm. maybe 2000, I will have freaked out and lost. Mm. So something else to keep in mind. Yeah, that's a good uh, tip uh, on chess. Uh, also, I think you have the send mode. I heard, um, uh, by the way, you can just pull up the position while I'm talking. Uh, but, go uh, ahead, go ahead. But it was, uh, I, I heard Gotham Chess on, on the Perpetual Chess uh, podcast. Uh, and and uh, Levy as well, he has had some issues with uh, getting nervous uh, when he's playing stronger opponents. And he utilized that uh, send mode and uh, climbed a lot of rating because of it. And uh, yeah. Well, I'm glad, I'm glad that we brought it up. To... So I'm now we got we raided. Uh, we got raided actually by chess.com. Thank you. So now uh, we need to go on a little bit more, uh, Robert. We got traded with. The... Ah, you got it. You got it. You got it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I, like I said, I, I could be here for twenty hours. So you just let me know. You just so let me know. it's thank you so much for the raid. Uh, we hope you will stay with us uh, for a while. I have uh, National Master Robert uh, Ramirez with me, and we are talking about pawn breaks today. So. Uh, Robert is a chessable author, but also a content creator on YouTube. So check out his links in the chat and uh, let's go on. And all right, all right. So we have been here for um, um, over 90 minutes talking about pawn breaks and the different plans associated, uh, depending on the pawn structure. The next two games that I wanted to show you, they go back to the same thing I said before. This is a game played by one of my favorite players, uh, Ruslan Ponomaryov where 
as you can see, he plays this hippo that we talked about before. I'm not saying play the hippo, but by him playing this and then eventually playing c5, as you're going to see here, he's not playing the hippo anymore. He's playing the Sicilian defense. It's like if you had started the game with, again, e4, c5. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to show you this one. Like, I was going to leave it here, but I'm like, let me show you these games by uh, uh, Ponomario as well. Because you're going to see after the white pieces take, he takes back with the P-pawn. And then the pawn structure in the center should dictate the game. After rook d1, queen to c7, getting away from this file, nothing special. We got queen to e2. And now I'm going to pass it to you again. Why would you play? And if you just uh, observe me and try to think, if I'm playing this game as black, what would I play now? Mm. I I guess uh, what you talked about it indicates we should play on the queen side, right? Okay, so pawn structure is aiming at the queen side, so I should have more space on that side. I should be playing there. We we mm. got that. I'm glad to see. And again, this should be a very weird position to most of you, and that's mm. what we're looking for. That regardless of the opening that you play, even if it's your favorite opening or not, if you look at the pawn structure after this lesson you should have an idea of where, where to expand. You should know your plan, your next five, 10 moves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think uh, if there's not uh, some immediate tactics here that I'm blind to, I think uh, for me, it would mm -hmm. just be natural to put the rook maybe in the uh, B file. Uh, okay, rook B8. It, it works uh, okay with the bishop on G7, I guess. And, and uh, Okay. Yeah. Well, Definitely rook b8 makes perfect sense. It's consistent with the plan. We got to play on the queen side. However, here, don't forget the queen side is going to be all of this. Mm -hmm. And it's very important. The initiative is very important. And Ponomario, he actually went ahead. He didn't miss an opportunity. He played pawn to d5, mm -hmm. which is the pawn break. That's the main topic of this lesson. And if you really visualize that, we talked about how to visualize better earlier. If your visualization is decent not even great you can see that after d5 it's safe because if they take i take if pawn takes i take back with the pawn i'm defended twice so it's safe but also what am i threatening after i play d5 you're threatening a fork on d4 exactly so it comes with a a fork so it's a very energetic move and after d5 pawn takes pawn takes the white pieces have to do definitely something about it now do you have any idea about how to play when you have first of all do you know the name for these pawns how do we call these pawns? is it hanging pawns hanging pawns uh do you have any idea about how what we should do when we have hanging pawns uh, actually what, what, this is uh, this is uh, one of the things i haven't really dove into but uh, from what i know i guess they could be a double-edged sword they could be uh, either a weakness but they could also be utilized for an attack. So I don't know, uh, would it make sense to try to advance them? Is my question. Okay. No, yeah, you're actually on point. It, it could be an asset. It could be trouble. Basically, you have to know how to play with them, how to play against them. So if I'm the one with the hanging pawns, like black in this case, the key is like we said before, these pawns are always best when they're next to each other. There are no mm -hmm. weaknesses. In this case, they control so much over the center, meaning the white pieces cannot really maneuver because of my pawns. So the key is don't advance the pawns unless you have to. For example, okay. if if I play c4 here, you can see how I'm leaving d4 weak. So a yeah. knight could come in there. If I play d4, then this knight that before couldn't go to the center, all of a sudden could go to the center and they get a very good position. Right. If I'm the person playing against the hanging pawns, let's say I'm white, my goal is to provoke the advancement of those pawns just to get out, take advantage of the weaknesses, right? So that's the main thing to keep in mind. Now, in this game, after bishop c1, they don't want the fork, we have rook a to e8. The only piece that is doing nothing, we bring it over, queen d2, knight h4, putting pressure on g2, and we're being energetic. After rook takes, rook takes, rook e1, we take on e1, queen takes, and then finally we go pawn to c4. Notice how it comes with a tempo, and in the following move, I can play d4 and put them next to each other again. Mm -hmm. Really, really important. 
if I had done okay, it before. So you can you can advance them, but you should make sure both of them are advanced so that they stay on a line, basically. Exactly, exactly. I like to say make sure you advance them when you have a good reason for it. Right. Mm. And but yeah, if they could continue to be next to each other, that'll be ideal. Notice that if I did this right now, they're already taking on G6, doubling yeah. up my pawns. Then D5 is going to be left behind, yeah. D4 will, will not happen. So those are the little things to keep in mind. So now, if I understand you correctly, uh, you advanced them there because you had a good reason to. It's not like it is the goal to, to further them. Is that correct? Exactly, exactly, exactly. Okay. If you visualize the couple moves down the road, you could see from here, okay, if I go C4, bishop moves, then I have D4. I can see that far, pawns are next to each other again, the pieces are moving back. I like that position, right? And that's exactly what happened. Keep in mind, this is Potomario, very strong grandmaster playing against another grandmaster. So this is not like him playing against me that I'm going to make any mistakes. It's just pushing the pawns. Mm -hmm. And then from here, many times we get such a nice position like this and we blow it. I've done it many, many times. Yeah. So this is just not good enough. Now we have to continue to be energetic. They're hitting the pawn on D4. So he went going to C5 and Knight to e4, just being energetic, putting pressure, putting pressure. By the way, knight e4 opens up the bishop. So knight e4. And, and just, uh, just a quick uh, question. When you say like they're mm -hmm. being energetic, you mean uh, you're making like uh, active moves. Aggressive. You're, you're advancing, you're playing moves that comes with a tempo. Exactly, exactly. And this is very important for beginner players. I always give the same analogy. Let's say you start doing boxing and the first class they have you box against another beginner i think the best strategy is to just throw punches even if you don't know how because the other person also doesn't know how to defend they haven't learned yet so it's the same thing here if you're a beginner and that's going back to the gulko advices uh gulko always says it's easier way easier to attack than it is to defend and it's mm. true mm. so even if i do a move here that is not right but it's an aggressive move. My opponent needs to prove that it's wrong. They need to find the right defensive move. And it's much easier to find attacking moves than it is to find defensive moves. And my favorite quote from Gulko is, he says, typically when you're attacking, the best move is a beautiful looking move. And typically when you're defending, the best move is a very ugly move. So <laughs> it's, 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 not, it's not that easy to find. And I've, I, again, if you're a beginner, intermediate, if you can be energetic. Don't worry if it's the best move or not. If you can be energetic, you're pushing your opponents to make mistakes. They're going to be under pressure, and that's very, very valuable. Um, at the big, at the grandmaster level, like in this game, well, the initiative is just so important. Mm. I don't know about you, but I would much rather be black than being white. I don't know yeah, how you feel agreed. if you look at it, it from looks, white. Uh, it looks so ugly <laughs> and passive, and exactly. you're, just, you're just cramped into a corner. Uh, so... Uh... In, and, and what I tell always my students is when I play against grandmasters, I always thought, well, if I play grandmaster, they're so much better. They're going to destroy me in 20 moves, game over, just go home. But every time I've played grandmasters and I've played a few already, they do the opposite. They just play quiet, quietly, and they wait for me to make a silly mistake, and then they capitalize on it. And I can see it here. All that the black pieces are doing is maintaining this very powerful position mm -hmm. and then if i'm white i'm going to feel desperate to do something you mm -hmm. feel uncomfortable you're like i gotta do something and then you make a mistake they collect and you mm -hmm. and you're done they don't care if they if it takes them 80 moves or 100 moves they just want to win the game and if it if it means being patient they will do it so i've learned from them when i play someone less experienced i do the same thing put pressure wait for them to make a mistake collect and win the game can I ask oh. you a, a bit of a, qu a question? Uh, yeah, of course, of course. Uh, the viewers probably catch this, but I'm still a bit confused regarding these uh, hanging pawns. So, uh, did I understand you correctly when you said it's not a goal in itself to advance them? Like, would you be happy to have those pawns on the fifth rank or are they better on the fourth rank? Because I feel like, don't you just get more space and territory when they are on the fourth rank as long as you ensure that they stay together aren't they a little bit better when you advance them or no or... no yeah yeah definitely these pawns on the fifth rank are much better than when they were on the fourth rank right 
you're yeah. deeper into the territory. The yeah. one thing to keep in mind is that you don't push one, only one of them, and yeah. then you have a weakness in between the pawns. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's why I said when they finally pushed it, they pushed it because they saw after you can, C4. You can do both. You can do both. Yeah. But now if C4 means my pawns are going to be like this for a long time, I don't want that because this is going to be yeah. a weak square they could occupy and so on, right? Okay, so, so the main goal is to keep them together, but it's often good next to, to each other. It's often good to advance them if you can make sure they are next to each other. Exactly, exactly. Okay. okay. Exactly. Hundred percent. Now after queen d1, we have knight to e4, take takes, knight to g3, hitting the bishop, bishop goes to g6. And very important, notice how this bishop went from looking to the king side to looking to the queen side. Why? We talked about this. If your pawn structure mm -hmm. is telling you you have more space on the queen side, you gotta play there. So my bishop is ah. is not gonna be attacking to the king side. I don't really have a lot of faction on the king side, and they seem to be defending pretty well. So as okay, why? But, as... Now, but now you kind of said ahead. something. Now you kind of said something that wasn't immediately clear to me before because when when the pawns were connected in a pawn chain and they were pointing to the queen side, then I felt like oh, okay, they, you have the connected chain. Going up the diagonal, you should play on the queen side. But here you kind of have, you don't have a connected pawn chain, but you have pawns that are further up advanced on the queen side. And then still the same rule counts. You should. Exactly. And, and, that, and that seems very obvious now uh, in, in retrospect, but I haven't thought about it before, actually. No, no. I'm glad that you're asking those questions because I know I, I went through the same process. Now, if we go back here, I don't know if you remember when we talked, sorry to go back and forth, but... Yeah. When we talked about this uh, position, we said, I told you, oh, sometimes people ask me, wait, why is it that I have to play on the king side for white? Mm -hmm. uh, I know that the pawn structure is telling me that, but why, why, why? Well, the why is because you have more space, right? So it's important that we understand the why. It's not that the pawns are in that direction. It's just that we have more space. So if yes. we go back to this position, we have more space on the queen side. I thought, so again, was, I thought it was crystal clear earlier, but now it's more crystal clear. Well, I'll tell you this. One thing that I always tell my students is it's never enough to hear one thing, one concept once. Like a lot of my students, we work for years. And when we look back, it's just me reinforcing the same thing over and over and over because yeah. it has to click. It has to click. It's, it's, it's the way it is. So don't be surprised if you end up doing the opposite in one of your games tomorrow when you play it's gonna mm -hmm. take a few times messing it up and then finally okay finally on my 20th game i yeah. got it now i Be got it because the important thing is to put the theory into practice and actually practice it right but but what i'm seeing here right now white is trying to trade off the officers right because they're at a space disadvantage that is another concept right yeah true if i'm being attacked i want to simplify the game that is true mm -hmm. but more than that i think they have to be uncomfortable with this piece as passive. Mm. So this is a way to say, let me at least throw a punch. At least let me mm. improve my knights and, and create something, right? It's just a way to activate the pieces. Mm. Now, after bishop g6, I think what the black pieces want is, well, if I could get a pass pawn, that's going to be too much, right? Mm. So after bishop g6, we have queen e2, and then we're not going to miss the opportunity to finally push. Notice again, I break this perfect formation. Mm -hmm. Think of soldiers, think of the, the Spartans. Next to each mm -hmm. other, there's no gaps, no one is coming in. Mm -hmm. When I break, it has to be with a tempo, that way they have no time to capitalize on it. Mm -hmm. And more than that, now my two powerful pawns become one isolated pawn, but that's a pawn that is very close to promotion. Mm -hmm. It comes with a tempo on the queen and the bishop. So mm -hmm. I hope by now, after two hours talking here, you we, you see the pattern. Strategy always leads to tactics. So once more, none of this makes any sense to learn it if your tactics are weak. So this is assuming that you're training your tactics, and when you get to this beautiful opportunity, you can take advantage of it. So yeah, so yeah Queen E8 was played. We love checks, Nana. Nah, nah. they, they, <laughs> they just have nothing better, right? Uh, King H7, then Bishop E3. Queen to d5, let's push, bishop d2, give me the pawn, and then you can see how everything just collapses. f3, bishop e5, putting pressure on the on the knight, knight goes to e4, and now, needless to say, give me that. 
Notice that we don't care about the pair of bishops anymore. We don't care about any of that because after you calculate bishop takes, pawn takes, queen takes, if you evaluate that position, you're winning by a couple pawns. My knight and queen are hitting the king side. You got a pass pawn. And lastly, just to do a quick uh, visualization exercise, let's say after bishop takes, pawn takes, queen takes, let's say the white pieces play pawn to a5. Bishop uh, h2 check and you pick up the queen on the eight. There you go. There you go. Very nice. <laughs> there you go. Boom. And then if they do something like that, you could do check and give me the queen, right? Yes. Discovery on oh, the queen. Oh, yeah. Good. Yeah. I, I wanted to get, I didn't have to give away the bishop there. I was so hey, eager to fit the queen. So. If, you, if you like to be fancy, I understand. It's okay. <laughs> you, you could do it like that. <laughs> yeah. And then we get the queen. But again, it always leads to tactics. When your pieces are active, tactics are in the air. Yeah, uh, this is uh, one of the lessons that I learned recently by um, Cesco Andras. I don't know if you know him, Andras Toth. Yeah, yeah, of course, of course. He looked at uh, a couple of my games and uh, and he told me uh, that I... He told me, you need to earn your attacks, Ulva. You can't just uh, keep attacking and go straight out of the opening and think that you're going to attack the king. You need to... You need to earn it. And I was like, what do you mean? I, I have earned this attack by birthright, right? <laughs> but uh, it's like, no, 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 you need to have, you earn it by having your pieces in good strategic formations. Exactly. And then exactly. you have earned it and then you can attack. So the tactics, they are kind of birthed by goodly placed pieces. I, I butchered That's this, exactly but, right. uh, but uh, this also seems pretty obvious in retrospect. But then again, I guess everything is obvious in <laughs> retrospect. <laughs> No, that, that's true. That's true. That's that's the best vision, right? Uh, but um, but just like we said at the beginning of this session, when we are beginners, we have so much information, so many things, and we just don't know what to follow, what's the right thing to do, what's not. Mm. And a lot of these things, we don't really see the value in them because we don't need to use them. Like you don't need, when you're a beginner, you don't need to have all of your pieces perfectly placed for a tactic because we're still dropping pieces. Like yeah. you just put the queen here and then you just go queen d7 and then they take it. <laughs> Nobody cares about perfectly, it happens all the time yeah. at the beginner level, right? So it doesn't, until you get to a level where nobody drops pieces, at least not so often, uh. that you need to say, you know what, I need better tools. And then I need, and that's why I say, to get to a thousand, you just need a good vision of the board, at least that's my experience. If you're just really good at not dropping pieces and collecting whenever someone drops a piece, mm -hmm. like hanging piece, you're gonna get to a thousand. And that comes from playing, doing your tactics, mostly playing and anything else. To get to, let's say 13, 1400, now you need to be good at simple tactics like the forks, the pins, checkmate in one move, checkmate in two moves, those two move combinations, that's gonna get you there. Then to get to the next one, well, you're going to need a little bit more visualization. You need your end games already to be taking shape. Mm -hmm. And you need your openings to be a little bit better. And then when you get to 17, 1800, then you need to bring all the things to your, to your arsenal. Mm -hmm. And it's just the way it goes. The thing is that when I say it to my students, when we meet for the first lesson, I tell them what we need to do and where we're going. And everyone is so pumped and they're so ready for it. And then when they start doing the actual work, they, they, they see that to get from this to this step, it takes a lot of time. Yeah. And then it's not, unless you're doing this for fun, it's, you're going to get frustrated. You're going to give up. Yeah. You're going to give up. So anyways, um, I think I'm going to leave it here. If yeah. you have any questions, I'm happy to go further to answer questions. But uh, uh, if, uh, if chat has any questions, uh, let us know in the chat before we, before we leave. Uh, my question to you would be, because you talked a lot about uh, tactics, so uh, how do you think, what is the best way for a beginner to train uh, tactics? And not only beginners, but also intermediate level players. Is it just doing the chest of calm puzzles or is it like a special way you recommend you practice tactics? Well, I'll tell you what I found, like, I, like again, after so many years doing this, I have already a few things that I that I have said, you know what, this is what works best for, for my beginner students, my intermediate students, and so on. Um, am I allowed to, to mention all the websites? I know you yeah, have. Yeah. <laughs> it's good. It's good. Okay, so let me go to um, this website. There are two, when it comes to tactics, there are two main areas that I found out that we need to work on, which is the quick thinking, the quick tactics, 
and then we need the deeper calculation, right? So three moves calculation, four move calculation, and so on. So one of the main things that I'm using, and if you guys know of any other website where you could do this, please let me know because I'm always looking for resources. But in case you're not, and also let me know, uh, let me know if you can see my screen. I, I went to a different website. You can see it, right? Yeah. Oh, you know what? I think I think you had cropped the board. I don't know if it's visible to see the whole thing. Yeah, I guess uh, maybe just uh, talking about it is fine. No, so I, I don't have to redo the... <laughs> you got it, you got it. Well, uh, I like Chess Tempo. Uh, there's one tool here where if you're in Chess Tempo, you, get, you create a free account, uh, you go to training Chess Tactics. There's one option where you click on Change Set. Now, one of those sets is called Blitz. So basically what it does is you set the difficulty level, let's say easy, medium, it doesn't matter. Uh, play around with that. Once you start, I like it because they give you a tactic and basically we're waiting for them to move. Like in a real game, they made the move. You gotta make your move right now. And the point is, let's say my move is queen b7. Boom, that's a fork and I get the knight. Perfect. Now, typically when you do this on other websites, they give you your points, like they gave me five five point nine, but uh, since this is the blitz set, there is uh, some stats over here. Maybe you don't see it, but it says this exercise has been done 1,274 times. 82% of them solved them correctly, and they spent an average of 31 seconds. So that means that I spent nine seconds to find it. But if I had spent, let's say, more than 31 seconds, even if I get it correct, they take time off. So this is going to condition your brain to not, to not only find the tactics, but find them quickly. And this is what I found to be really successful to help my students find th this quick thinking. Like you're playing a game, they say hanging piece, you see it quickly. They say fork, you see it quickly. This has helped a lot. We also use chess.com just with the regular tactics. Um, I like combining this, the blitz set, with solving mates in three, mates in four. Maybe you struggle to find mates in two. Okay, do lots of that. You could find a book, you could do it on chess.com, you could do it on this chess, here in Chess Tempo as well. If you get really good at that, well, let's do mates in three. Can you calculate mates in three? Then let's do mates in four. And I like doing it for a while with mates because you know what you're looking for. You're looking for mates and you just need to calculate. Can you see it clearly until the end? Don't move the pieces. Don't do the first move because mm -hmm. that's another thing. A lot of people are like, ah, you know what, it should be this one. Let me do it and see what happens next. No, no, no. If you don't yeah. see the whole thing in your head, then it's not good. Even if you get it right, you, it defeats the purpose. So for tactics at this level, beginner, intermediate, that's uh, what I found to be more successful. Of course, I'm not saying do it two days and you're good. I'm talking about consistently over an extended period of time. Yeah, and then uh, we got uh, one more question for you before, uh, before we let Talk you to go. Me. Uh, and I guess this is a question you're going to like. Uh, at what point do you need to seriously learn opening theory? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, we always say the general advice is you start by no learning, not learning anything about openings, just play, capture pieces. Just uh, I tell my students, it's like playing, what's that game? Uh, Pac-Man. It just it, it, it. So just eat. Right, and then you start learning about the principles, not the openings, but develop your minor pieces, control the center, castle, and then eventually you start learning openings, but you don't learn an entire course on an opening. You just learn the first five, six moves to get the ideas and so on and, so, and, 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 and keep on going. That's the general advice. For me, I think whenever you get to that point where you're not dropping pieces like a complete beginner, it's okay to start picking up an opening to start playing it. I have mm -hmm. students who are 1,000 on chess.com and they play the Sicilian defense. Now, anyone, any coach experienced will tell you, what do you mean a 1,000 playing the Sicilian defense? It makes no sense. But to me, I don't care because they're not going in and spending two hours a day to learn their Sicilian. It could be because we reviewed a master game just to talk about tactics. They saw that Kasparov played the Sicilian and they want to play it. Play it. They just know the first five, six moves because they saw it in Kasparov games. They don't know any more than that. But, you know, they start to play it like that. They see the pawn structure and then the game goes in its own direction. And they're playing the Sicilian because they play C5 as the first move. But then five moves later, they're just playing chess. 
So, yeah, it's it's kind of like what I do. I, I I like to say I don't play the Sicilian. I play the C five and hope for the best Sicilian. That is the variation I play. Yeah, and, and look, it, <laughs> it it doesn't matter because you're not playing advanced players yet. Just yeah. like you're a beginner, your opponents are beginners. They're not gonna, they're not gonna punish you. We're going to so, get out of theory. I, uh, really soon other way so exactly exactly so i guess to answer your question what i like to say is don't worry about opening so much don't worry about mm. any of that have fun play mm. the one thing it's like in in and again i always like to relate it to life in life you always hear people talking about diet what's the best diet what's the best thing mm. and at least in my experience what i've read and what i understand is that we don't know about diet, but one thing that is good for sure is exercising. Mm. If you exercise, that's proven to be good. So the same thing in chess. Tactics is proven to be good. Mm. That's the most important thing. Uh, 90% is tactics, tactics, tactics. And to wrap up, I can always I always say the same example. If you ever go to New York, uh, there is it's very popular. You go to different parks and they have people playing like street players. Um, and which reminds me when I was in Cuba, we had the chess academy and outside there was always a table for anyone from the street to come and play. When I was a beginner, I would play with these guys. Just like when I went to New York, I had to play these other guys. And you can tell they don't really know any openings. They do the most bizarre op uh, opening <laughs> moves. But they're there playing all day, smoking, just talking trash and playing. <laughs> that they're really good at vision of the board. Mm. You leave a piece hanging, they'll see it immediately. They can see a two-move combination. Mm. And they'll beat me left and right until I finally got my tactics where they needed to be. Yeah. But if if those guys could beat you without opening, that that shows is the most important thing: the tactics, the vision of the board. So something yeah, to keep a, in mind. That's great, uh, Robert. And uh, thank you so much for for joining us today. It's been a lot of fun, and I've learned a, my learned pleasure. a lot of new things. <laughs> and also, again. Uh, check out uh, uh, Robert's uh, Chessable courses and also his YouTube is amazing. He has a lot of free content uh, from uh, beginner to master level YouTube playlist. That's really great. Even though you're not playing the King's Indian or anything like that, uh, you know, there, there's a lot of things to learn there. So I would highly recommend checking it out. And uh, yeah, thank you so much for being here with us today, uh, Robert. And uh, My pleasure. And, and feel free to reach out. Anything else you need, happy to, to help. Yeah, that's that's awesome. Thank you so much. Chat is thanking you as well. So enjoy your day. Thank you, you too. Bye bye. <laughs> bye bye. Oh, that was uh, a lot of fun. I really enjoyed that uh, a lot. I think you guys uh, liked it as well. Uh, seems like you're kind of happy at least. <laughs> I'm really happy I got to have uh, Robert on. He's uh, such a cool guy. And um, I meant what I said. It's like his YouTube channel is just uh, a mine of gold. I've learned a lot uh, by watching that YouTube channel. And I, I just think it's so nice when people put out uh, free content like that. Because, you know, it's not everyone who has um, the opportunity to have, you know, private coaching and things like that. So to have people putting out this free content is just so invaluable. And uh, I think I'm going to log off as well. But uh, do you guys have any suggestions who we should raid? We should probably raid someone so and send you over to some channel. Do you know someone who is streaming right now or streaming chess, I should say? If you do, please uh, help me uh, write some suggestions in the chat. Yeah, of course, uh, John Chandler and uh, everyone else. Thank you so much for being active in the chat. Um, it's been really great to see you guys again. I'm on my summer holiday now, so I'm going to do uh, more streaming. I'm going to do some uh, serious chess training, going to do some rapid games and things like that. So you don't have any suggestions for who to stream? I guess I will check out Twitch myself then and see if I know anyone who's streaming. Let's see, Asius is streaming, but he's streaming Elden Ring. I don't know if you're interested in that. You know what, I think I'm going to raid Asius. So, I'm sorry if you don't like uh, Elden Ring, but, uh, you know, it's a, it's a friend of Magnus Carlsen, so uh, say hello for me, and uh, thank you so much for, uh, for being here with me today. It was amazing, and uh, see you next time.